I was the longtime executive director of Alaska Legal Services. And yes, Ryan, I was there before you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and ALSC um, is our state's um, only comprehensive provider of free civil legal aid. And before being the executive director, I was a supervising attorney of the Anchorage and South Central offices and the Bristol Bay offices. And then before that, I was a staff attorney. I came up to ALSC right out of law school where I met Mara one day <laughs> and we drove around in a car together, which is fun to think about. <laughs> I started right out of law school and during my 25 years in the field, I have covered cases across all subject matter areas um, from domestic violence to adult guardianships, evictions, public benefits, access to health care, native allotments and ICWA. I handled both individual and impact cases, trials, appeals and transactional work because at legal aid, that's how it works. You do it all. And so it's safe to say that there is really no job or case type that I haven't done during my time um, at legal aid. And in doing this work, I've made lifelong friends who have made my, uh, across the state, who have changed my life for the better. And there are so many of you in this room today. I love how we've kept each other company through the hardest days of this work and weathering one storm after the other and always plotting to try to get to another place and a better, and to find a way to meet the overwhelming demand for legal help in our community. And this, I wanna be clear that this keeping each other company is no small thing. Right? And it is directly and deeply connected to what I want to talk with you about today, which is how we get to a future where justice is a reality for everyone. For me, I believe that community justice and well-being are so inextricably intertwined that you cannot have one without the other. And it is at this nexus where the future of the access to justice movement lies. But before I get to that, I want to spend a minute on hope why it matters and what it can mean to hope in times like these, which are fraught across so many fronts that it can seem like despair is the only realistic option. One of my favorite writers, Rebecca Solnitz, says this about hope. Hope is not a lottery ticket you can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. It's an act she breaks down doors with because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and the marginal. Hope is to give yourself to the future. And that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. And I'll admit that finding your way to hope in times like these can seem impossible, futile, and even maybe a bit naive in light of what the evidence tells us about the state of things. And the data I'm gonna share with you today about the, our civil justice crisis is so daunting that you may wanna look away from it. But I'm gonna make the case that while there's enormous cause for concern, about the status of our, the accessibility of our current civil justice system, there is also much room for hope. And that hope lies in looking squarely at the evidence and committing to a future that accounts for it. So first, let's start with the size and the scope of the problem. It is enormous. People in our nation experience between 150 and 250 million civil legal problems each year. These problems impact every demographic, but they disproportionately affect the poor and people of color. The Legal Services Corporation's latest justice gap report that a stunning 92% of the needs of those with low incomes go unmet. 92%. We aren't failing on the margins, we are failing on the whole. This is an extraordinary number, and as most of you or all of you in this room know, it has dire consequences for individuals and families that go without this help. It means that family breadwinners lose their jobs. It means children can't go to school. Elders can't receive health care. Family homes are foreclosed upon. Children are taken into state's custody or instead of staying with their relatives or in the communities. And the list goes on and on. It also, this lack of access undermines our institutions and our democracy. According to the latest World Justice Index, the United States is ranked 46th, which is dead last among wealthy nations regarding the accessibility and affordability of the civil justice system. So as I was preparing for this, the words of the song kept ringing, running through my head and it's something like, are you looking up? Are you asking why? And I think these are the right questions we ought to be asking. Can we look up from our daily grind from the fire hose that's like, gushing into our face and ask why, why is this happening systemically? Because if we don't look at the root of this crisis, we will, uh, to paraphrase Dr. King, we will end up with solutions that don't solve, answers that don't answer, and explanations that don't explain. 
So what do we know about why people can't get the help when they need it? We know a few things and a few reasons. And one of those is that historically in looking at this problem and thinking about it, we've been very lawyer centric and lawyer focused, seeking more ways to get more lawyers. And we have restricted the practice of law to lawyers only. And the problem with lawyer focused, lawyer only solutions is that they simply don't scale, which is what my colleague Becky Santa first says, who you'll hear from her later today. They are too expensive for most people to afford at $350 per hour. They're often not in the right places. There are huge swaths of our country, including most of Alaska, where there are no lawyers. And this is true for many in the lower 48 and our friends in Hawaii as well. They also take too long to grow. Practicing law requires seven years of higher education and a bar exam. It is very expensive and it too often excludes those most impacted from being able to achieve the credentialing needed to help others with solutions. So then you might think, well, isn't this what legal aid's for? And what about pro bono? Okay. And yes, of course, there is a role to play for legal aid and pro bono attorneys. But as you all know, legal aid is vastly underfunded. Community demand far outstrips resource, available resources, so much so that most legal aid providers I know, including the one I worked for, Alaska Legal Services, and that I love with all of my heart, um, are forced to turn away one person for everyone that they help. And they're turning away people, not because their cases lack merit, and not because there aren't serious consequences for going without the legal help, and not because there aren't laws that will protect them. They're turned away for lack of resources. And those lawyers who have dedicated their lives to this work are then turned into gatekeepers, forced to ration justice, deciding which of our neighbors will get the help that they all deserve. And this is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking for those who have to go without, and it's also heartbreaking for those who have to triage such scarce resources. And it doesn't have to be this way. So we are nowhere near funding legal aid at the level it would take to meet community need. Nationally, it would take an estimated $37 billion to do so. And current funding from all sources for legal aid is just a drop in the bucket at 1.4 billion. So what about pro bono? Here, again, the math just doesn't work out. To get just one hour of legal help for everyone who needs it, it would require 100% of lawyers, all of them, to dedicate 150 hours per year. And again, we're nowhere near that. And it simply just isn't going to happen. But even if we were to conjure up enough money and enough lawyers to address the vast unmet legal needs that exist in our nation, we will not have solved this crisis because the evidence tells us this isn't even the biggest problem that people face in this area. It turns out the biggest problem we face is that most people don't understand the needs that they are facing to be legal in the first place. Research shows that lawyers, legal aid, and judges are seeing only the tip of the iceberg. Judges and lawyers, <clears throat> including legal aid providers, are only seeing the things that lay people identify as legal problems. And that's less than 20% of them. We are missing the enormous mass of problems that lie beneath that iceberg. And people don't see these as legal problems. They see them as simply life problems. And it makes sense that people are not gonna seek out lawyers to help with problems they don't understand to be legal in the first place. So if we hope to reach those folks, we need to get outside of our current legal silos or infrastructures and meet people where they are through the people they trust to help them with their life problems. But right now our civil justice system is mostly lawyer focused, designed by and for lawyers to meet the demands, to meet the needs of lawyers and it can be very siloed. So a few years ago, I asked my colleague, Liz Medicine Crow, the legendary past president of uh, the First Alaskans Institute, what do we miss when we center lawyers instead of those most impacted in the design of our justice systems. And her answer was simple and it floored me. She said, we miss justice itself. We aren't slightly off target. We have entirely missed the boat and the whole point of the exercise. And when you look to the evidence, I think she's right. But if we choose up, to look up, if we choose to ask why, if we choose to go wide to expand our scope, we might find that the solutions that our way to solutions that not only have the capacity to match the magnitude of the crisis, but that also might be better on the whole at achieving something that feels like justice to those on the receiving end of it. Once we understand the cause, we can understand again that it doesn't have to be this way and that better justice is possible. We can start, imagine to, we can start to imagine less narrow possibilities, ones that can scale and also bridge the divide between our legal system and people's life problems, which I think is the real goal here. 
So we started to do that in this state. Our community, with many of those in this room here today, came together under the leadership of our Supreme Court with support from the Bar Association and in partnership with Legal Aid and so many other community-based organizations like the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, Alaska Pacific University, ABCP and CANA, and so many others to face these startling facts and head on and shifted thinking, our thinking about how we might tackle this problem in a new way. We accepted that our civil justice crisis required us to move beyond lawyer only solutions, that we could not do it alone. And that allowed us to craft solutions that took into account the complexities of our state, which as everyone in this room knows is bigger than the next three states combined with a very small population of only 750,000 of us scattered across this vast expanse. We looked to craft a solution that could work in the road connected communities like Anchorage, as well as hub communities and villages. We looked at the systemic drivers and took stock of local assets and resources. Our court system conducted an asset mapping, a community asset mapping and social networking analysis that unsurprisingly showed that the lawyers in the court system are mostly located along the, the road system. But we didn't stop there. We wanted to understand in those communities where there weren't access to the legal system, what already existed, what other infrastructure existed. And we learned <clears throat> that the tribally operated healthcare system had a far greater reach than the legal system has across our state, that there is an outpost of this healthcare system in almost every single community. And so the legal aid organization, ALSC, started a conversation with healthcare leaders to see if we could embed legal aid lawyers within the healthcare systems to borrow some of their infrastructure and expand our reach. And this partnership proved to be transformative because we learned that the tribally operated healthcare system had been for 40 years, they were ahead of us in trying to address the same problems that we were now solving for as lawyers. And it helped us think about how we might reimagine our legal aid delivery system into one that might better meet community demand. We learned that our healthcare partners have built out a full range of healthcare practitioners, all trained to perform various procedures. We learned about community health days and dental health therapists and behavioral health aides. And we wondered if we could build out the justice analog of the community health aid program. And that's where the Alaska Community Justice Worker Model was born. So together with our community partners, we developed targeted training programs that were specific to widespread community problems. Areas of low hanging legal fruit were simple legal problems that were currently being left unaddressed were having a huge impact on the client communities. And we sought to infuse specific legal knowledge across people who are already helping address life problems that just so happen to have a legal fix. So have you ever been helped by a community health aid? Anybody in this room? What about another first responder, like a paramedic? Or have you seen an EMT in action, anyone? Can you imagine our healthcare system without them? Community justice workers aim to be the justice equivalent of these crucial actors in our healthcare system. They are people in a wide range of trusted roles within their community. They could be health aides or tribal administrators or social workers who have been trained and are supported by Alaska Legal Services Community Justice Worker Resource Center. And again, they, and critically, they are the people who people go to with their life problems. And because of the other training, such as as a social worker, our healthcare provider, they have the skills people need to holistically navigate these life problems. Such justice workers are often drawn from the communities they are serving. And this means they are closer to the problems and come with that community knowledge that is so hard to come by, but is essential to achieving real justice, I think. I find hope in this idea of infusing legal expertise across those with deep community knowledge aiming for a system where everybody can know, use, and shape the law. I also think the community justice workers are doing something else that is essential to achieving true justice. Community justice workers do the important work of keeping people company as they struggle through their life problems. And again, that is no small thing. When we keep each other company through the hard times, we begin to negotiate these distances between ourselves and others, and we weave each other into the tapestry of a shared life. And in such accompaniment, we are creating the spaces of belonging. So here, we developed a justice worker program that both fits our community's needs and leverages our community's strengths. We chose this route because we saw strong evidence that it could be success, it could be effective and sustainable. And we and could scale up to meet the needs of our state's people. 
Experience and solid empirical research show that safety, effectiveness, and positive impact of justice workers in other contexts. So Alaska's community justice worker uh, model is showing promising results, which you're gonna hear about later today. To date, hundreds of community justice workers have been recruited and either trained or in the process of being trained, and they are supervised by the uh, legal aid organization in and in partnership with uh, other community-based organizations. They're in 40 plus different communities, Alaska communities, most of which are off the road system and are much more reflective of the client communities they serve than legal aid staff. So in 2022, uh, Alaska Supreme Court with support from the Bar Association approved the first of its kind in the nation broad-based waiver that provides authorization for community justice workers to take on increasingly more complex matters. This model is being exported in the lower 48 and there are as many as 20 other states including Texas, California, Washington DC and Hawaii considering adopting a variation on this model. And I think what the Alaska model stands for is not a cookie cutter approach to justice, but rather a process, a commitment to looking at the evidence and then tailoring a response that takes into account local resources and knowledge. And to be clear, justice workers are not an alternative to lawyers or legal aid, but they really are just a complement to that. So the Alaska community justice worker model holds the promise of bespoke justice solutions that weave community knowledge with legal expertise to get justice solutions that center people the people using the system instead of the lawyers. And I came to lead frontline justice based on my 25 years in the field, having seen this is the only scalable solution to the crisis that I've come across during that time. So I'm a true believer. Now, some of you in this room might worry, what if it goes wrong? We don't want a two tiered system of justice where some people get less than the best. And I hear you, I worry about that too. But I believe community justice workers are the better justice that we are looking for. I believe it's the gold standard. I think everyone in our country should have access to right size, on demand, effective legal help from a trusted community source at the time that they need it. And I am definitely not afraid of trying something new because the evidence shows us that our current system is not serving our communities well at all. The weight of injustice is crushing us and my shirt is wearing thin on this issue. And can you imagine if it worked, if everyone was empowered to know and use the law? Can you imagine the power in that? I can. I think this is the kind of power that Dr. King was talking about when he said power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice and justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. And that's what I'm dreaming about. The exactly. kind of power that doesn't just balance the scales, but rearranges them entirely. So my hope is for a future when justice permeates the atmosphere like the air we breathe, universally and equally available to all. I think our communities, our neighbors, and our nation deserve this better justice. And I believe the only way we're going to get there is to include the closest to the problems in the solutions. And I invite you to commit to this future. And I'm hoping that you will keep me company as we head in that direction. Will you join me? <laughs> yes. What do you think, Susan? Thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for that great keynote to kick us off. And we can have our uh, first panelists start to make your way to the front. Um, like Professor Fortson mentioned, my name is Allison Barkley. I'm the current editor-in-chief at the Alaska Law Review. I'll be our, our MC today as we transition between speakers and panels. Um, so I'm very excited to turn to our first panel of the day, which is um, going to be discussing perspectives on tribal jurisdiction. And our moderator for this panel is Catherine Kunjan. Catherine is a dedicated law student and the president of the Student Bar Association at Lewis and Clark Law School, where she also serves as the executive editor of the Lewis and Clark Law Review. Her academic pursuits include the study of civil procedure, conflict of laws, and federal Indian law, with a particular interest in Alaska Native legal issues. Catherine has consistently advocated for diversity and inclusion within her current school, and also at the University of Alaska, where she attained her master's degree while working as staff until 2022. 
Her legal work has led her home to intern twice in Southeast Alaska, and she plans to return to Alaska after law school. And Catherine, I will pass it over to you to introduce our panelists. I think just for the Zoom folks. Susan, you black bitch. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Uh, welcome everyone, I'm Catherine and I am pleased to introduce our panel this morning. Um, the first is Alex Clayhorn, who is the COO of the Alaska Native Justice Center where he directs ANJC's legal and policy agendas uh, to further the mission, mission of justice for Alaska Native people. As a lawyer for nearly 20 years, Alex has primarily represented tribes and tribal organizations. He has also served as an assistant attorney general and a special assistant Are we to the Alaska talking about attorney legal? Um, sorry, where the where he led and coordinated efforts to build collaborative relationships between the state and tribes. Before returning home to Alaska, Alex also served as a tribal judge in California. Alex is Supiak, and reflecting Alaska's unique legal landscape, he is both a tribal citizen of Tongahana Native Village and a shareholder of Natives of Kodiak, Koniag Incorporated, and Cook Inlet Region Incorporated. Sorry. Uh, he, select, he is selected to serve on the Tribal Council of the Tongahanak Native Village, and as a director of Koniak Incorporated, he is also a husband and father and lives in Anchorage with his family. Next with us is Kirsten Malloy Carlson, who is a professor of law and distinguished board of governors faculty fellow at Wayne State University. She is a leading authority on federal Indian law. Her interdisciplinary empirical research investigates access to justice issues, including legal mobilization and law reform strategies used by Native people to reform law and policy effectively. Her work seeks to elevate Native voices in their quest for justice with the legal system and has been funded by the American Bar Association, the JPB Foundation Access to Justice Scholars Program, the National Science Foundation, and the Levin Center at Wayne Law. Kirsten earned a PhD in political science and a JD from the University of Michigan and was a Fulbright Scholar in New Zealand. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Okay, so to start, our panelists will now each introduce their authored pieces and we'll start with Alex. Sure. I want to make sure that folks online can hear me. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna go over the main points of what I'm trying to convey in the piece. Um, and then I really look forward to discussion and questions. So starting from the premise that Alaska tribes um, are sovereign governments, uh, like tribes in the lower 48, those inherent rights um, uh, predate the United States and the state of Alaska. And the sovereignty includes the power to make and enforce our own laws. Um, now, that's not to say that there haven't been limits on that sovereignty. Um, certainly, um, that sovereignty can't be diminished by the state, but some federal laws, particularly the Major Crimes Act, have impacted um, tribal jurisdiction uh, and injected federal jurisdiction into Indian country. And I'm going to get to a discussion about Indian country and how Alaska is different, but I don't think it's that different. But it does require us to shift our lens when we talk about Alaska. But shifting our lens shouldn't mean and does not mean that Alaska is less than the lower 48 and that somehow Indian country is the standard we should be reaching for. Um, and also in the discussion of limits upon, federal limits placed upon tribal jurisdiction, I talk quite a bit about Public Law 280. I think the impact of Public Law 280 is greatly overstated in Alaska. One, Public Law 280 injected state jurisdiction into Indian country. Well, we don't have a lot of Indian country in Alaska. We've got Metlakatla, and we've got about a million acres of Alaska Native lands. And with the solicitor's most recent opinion last winter, we now have the rebuttable presumption that Alaska tribes do have governmental authority over that Indian country. 
And so it'll be interesting to see what the next 20 years bring in the discussion, hopefully not the litigation over tribal jurisdiction related to those allotments. But again, that's not where most Alaska Native people live on those allotments. And when we talk about public safety and justice and the impact of public law 280, the state has jurisdiction throughout Alaska uh, in places where Alaska Native people live uh, in a way that we don't experience uh, outside of Alaska. So the state has concurrent jurisdiction. The lasting impact of public law 280 and the most damaging impact of public law 280 is that when the federal government took a step back and said to the state, you're now primarily responsible for public safety and justice in Alaska, those federal funds went elsewhere. Right? So tribes in Alaska uh, and other PL280 states do not have access to those federal funds to take over and self-determine them. Nicole introduced the idea of the tribal health system. And for folks who live outside of Alaska or who don't participate in the tribal health system, I think it's hard to understand the scope and reach of what self-determination and uh, has built. Uh, the tribal health system is first a, a tribal system. And two, that federal money that was needed to mm -hmm. kick the engine of the tribal health system. One, it was absolutely necessary to get the system started, but now it is the vast minority of the funding that runs that system. And tribal justice systems haven't even been given that little bit of gas to get the engine started, right? Tribal justice systems are funding their programs through every year special one-time funding and competitive grants. And we know this well at the Alaska Native Justice Center because we're funded in the same way. Every year, you don't know what you're gonna to get to run the programs that are needed in the community. And from one year to the next, you may have to shut down a program that's been successful because uh, federal funding priorities have shifted or because uh, the appropriations that were made don't meet the need. So imagine for a minute trying to run your tribal police department. You've hired a couple of people. You have enough funding uh, to have some part-time coverage. But um, I don't know, the government shuts down. And maybe there's no appropriations or the appropriations were less than they were the year before. There are tribes in Alaska that are literally having um, bingo to fund public safety officers on the ground. That is the lasting impact of Public Law 280 in Alaska. I then talk about this historical path to sovereignty and recognition. And I think it's important to recognize um, that uh, while VAWA 22 has really clarified what the jurisdictional scheme in Alaska, that there was hard fought battles for many years over sovereignty and recognition. The state initially contested that there were tribes in Alaska and took litigating positions over the years that ANCSA terminated tribes, that somehow Public Law 280 terminated tribes, uh, that Alaska was just so different that we, we didn't have tribes at all. Uh, but in 1999, the Alaska Supreme Court in John V. Baker said, that's got to stop. There are tribes in Alaska. Maybe they don't have land, but this idea of non-territorial sovereignty, right? That tribes continue to have jurisdiction over our citizens and activities that impact our citizens outside of Indian country is now bedrock in Alaska. And this idea of non-territorial sovereignty has uh, been embraced in some regions in the state and tribes in the state and tribal courts are functioning uh, outside of what some thought was necessary in Indian country and hearing cases related to child welfare, public safety, um, uh, inheritance, uh, a multitude of issues. And tribal courts are issuing those orders more regularly. 
And I'm going to pick up this theme later on about this concurrent jurisdiction and tribes in Alaska issuing more and more decisions. And this, um, I guess it's ripe for the uh, interesting balance that must happen in a concurrent jurisdiction environment, the communication between Alaska tribes and our courts and the state court system and their courts um, means that there has to be much more communication between these courts to resolve jurisdictional conflicts. But then I spend a good amount of time talking about VAWA 22 and what it means. Um, and there's two main parts of the Violence Against Women Act of 22. Uh, first, though, we want to recognize the many years of efforts that Alaska tribes, tribal leaders, and advocates put forward into making sure that VAWA 22 became a reality. It wouldn't have happened without those efforts. Significant time, effort, resources, and treasure went into advocating for a federal statute that was unique to Alaska, that recognized and helped correct what was left out in the, the prior versions of VAWA. So first, what does VAWA 22 do? It recognizes and affirms that every Alaska tribe has full civil and criminal jurisdiction over every native person present within the village. That's the same kind of jurisdiction that tribes in the lower 48 have over native people within quote unquote Indian country. It's not Indian country. It is a recognition that villages as listed in ANCSA and the maps that the Census Bureau goes uh, out and creates every 10 years that um, you can go look up online now and find your village's map and every native person uh can you just shut up please thank you would you like me to stop for a second you're, you're okay I think i'm okay you're okay um every native person within the village uh and the goal in crafting that language and having a defined map um, was in response to the public safety crisis in rural Alaska that um, Alaska Native people, particularly Alaska Native women, bear the brunt of. So for any tribe in Alaska that has been exercising jurisdiction, that is now affirmed. It didn't change what many of us believe to be true, but it does clarify it for folks who were confused. The second part of VAWA 22 is the pilot project, which provides tribes in Alaska a pathway towards exercising criminal jurisdiction over non-native people that, ex, uh, that commit certain violent crimes, nine violent crimes within the village. That pathway is long, um, and we now have uh, I believe it is 11 tribes that have signed up to participate in the Alaska Intertribal Working Group to support each other in building the capacity and moving down that path together to being able to exercise criminal adjudicatory jurisdiction over non-native people that commit violent crimes in the community. Part of a well-functioning tribal justice system or any justice system uh, I was taught early on involves three C's. You need a court, you need codes, and you need cops. Right? The other part of this functioning system is the role of police officers or public safety officers. Tribal police officers in Alaska every day fill critical safety gaps, addressing public safety needs where state enforcement and public safety is limited. Despite best efforts, and I and I am assuming goodwill that the state has not been able to establish a consistent public safety footprint uh, throughout Alaska. You know, the, um, the findings of VAWA make very clear that there are two tiers of public safety in Alaska. There are those of us who can pick up a phone and call 911 and expect some sort of response. And there are those of us in the state who pick up the phone and call 911 
and know not to expect somebody to be for hours or sometimes days. So tribal police officers who are hired and employed by tribes in Alaska fill that gap. And then finally, I conclude with this discussion about concurrent jurisdiction and cooperation needs. We're seeing more and more of this. Uh, we just had a case in Southeast Alaska where uh, two parties, um, one party went to tribal court and one party went to state court around the same time. And Alaska doesn't have a, a court rule uh, talking about what we should do when, the, when parties uh, go to different sovereigns to solve their problems. Um, and uh, ANJC represented the tribe in that case uh, in uh, the district level uh, and last month received um, an order uh, dismissing the case in state court and saying that because it had been filed in tribal court first and adopting the factors that we had put forward from, um, from Wisconsin in evaluating whether or not the tribal court or the state court was the proper jurisdiction to hear the case. And as I said, we expect more of these conflicts or um, opportunities for collaboration between state courts and tribal courts. And perhaps it is time for an Alaska court rule that provides the same kind of guidance that we see in other public law 280 states so that um, state court judges and tribal court judges are given clear guidance about which sovereign gets to hear the case. Um, but that's a lot of me talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Yeah, you bet. If we could now hear from Kirsten. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today. And like all good lawyers, I want to start with a disclaimer, and that is um, that I am not from Alaska. Um, and so I bring kind of an outsider's perspective to thinking about this based on working on access to justice issues in Indian country in the lower 48, and particularly um, with Anishinaabek communities in the state of Michigan. Um, and I want to say that I was really, really pleased that I got to follow Alex because Alex got to put all of the assumptions out and I don't have to reframe them for you because I'm building off the same set of assumptions he has about Alaska Native tribes being sovereigns, similar because there are some differences, but basically on the same and they should be on the same standing as the tribes in the lower 48. Um, and so what I do is I use access to justice as a framework for understanding and thinking about how we can improve the experiences that people have with justice events, organizations, and institutions. And Nicole did a fantastic job this morning talking about the demonstrated access to justice gap that we have in the United States. And I just want to add that this extends, as she hinted at, to Alaska, um, and to some extent seems even more dire in some ways that an individual in Alaska faces 2.1 legal issues every 18 months. And because of the extreme morality here, the access to what we think of in a lawyer-centric system as justice is much more attenuated. Um, so what I have been thinking about and what my paper really thinks about is how can Alaska Natives develop justice systems that help them find workable solutions to access to justice in their communities. And like Alex, I start from the premise that Alaska Native have recognized sovereignty and tribal governments. Um, and what my paper does is I argue that Alaska Natives have to exercise jurisdiction on their own terms, consistent with their cultural sovereignty to adequately address the access to justice issues that they're facing. And what I emphasize is the importance of cultural match to exercising jurisdiction and finding solutions to access to justice problems. So by cultural match, what I'm talking about is that native institutions, including justice systems, have to reflect the prevailing ideas in the community about how authority should be organized and exercised. Um, and so you might be thinking, okay, well, why are you worried about that? Um, and the reason that I'm worried about that, and Alex alluded to this, is that there are parts of the current system of the state and federal governments recognizing Alaska Native jurisdiction only when their justice systems meet certain conditions. And this leads to a potential for cultural mismatch or a disconnect between cultural sovereignty and jurisdiction. And this is something that we face in the lower 48 as well, which is as part why um, it 
concerns me. It's because I've seen how this plays out um, in other places and think that there are some real opportunities here in Alaska to prevent these situations. Um, but the concern I have has to do with how conditions placed on native jurisdiction complicate Alaska native government's abilities to address access to justice issues. So I'm concerned more about that second part of VAWA, um, the type of pilot project that's been being organized, both it's been organized in the lower 48, but is also going on here. And um, because what VAWA does is that it enables Alaska native governments to exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-natives, but only when certain conditions are met. Um, they have to provide adversar adversarial style courts. They have to meet federally mandated requirements. And these include things like the right to counsel and a law trained judge. So part of what this part of Iowa does is it perpetuates that lawyer centric model. Um, and a court centric model. And it says that if you want to exercise jurisdiction um, and have us recognize it, because I think there's a real debate and I think Alex alluded to this about whether this jurisdiction exists regardless of whether the United States recognizes it or not. But if you want the recognition, you have to do it kind of on our terms. Um, and VAW is a good example of how that happens in the criminal context, but it happens in the civil context as well. Um, the Indian Civil Rights Act requires that all native governments in the United States provide due process. And what can happen is if you don't provide due process that meets the expectations of a federal court, the federal court will not recognize that you have jurisdiction. So while under ICRA, there is a lot of availability for interpretation of what due process means. If we want to have a discussion about um, legal indeterminacy, I think we could spend a lot of time talking about due process. It's very open. Um, but the problem is that you can have your jurisdiction denied if a federal court disagrees with how you interpret it. Um, and this, to me, presents a problem because it basically says that jurisdiction can only be exercised on the terms of what the federal or state government recognizes. And these conditions or expectations of a justice system do not necessarily match how Alaska Natives or Native people in the lower 48 address and think about criminal and civil legal issues or the realities on the ground in these communities. Um, so, for example, um, one of the problems here in Alaska is that, as um, Nicole pointed out, the lawyers in Alaska are kind of all concentrated in one place. So it would be great for, I mean, maybe not great, but you can't say you have to have a lawyer in a place where there are no lawyers. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, and so one of those problems is that you don't have lawyers. They're not readily accessible. Um, and th there's a question about whether you even want them. I mean, I've already told you all I'm a lawyer. And I have to admit, I'm not sure I like the idea of having more lawyers in my community. So it's a, a perspective that's very limited. And there are currently some Alaska Native courts that don't want lawyers. They want to limit the role of lawyers because they want to hear directly from the people. And there is a certain value to that and having that opportunity. But if you have to exercise jurisdiction within certain limits, then you don't have the type of choice and the free range to craft solutions that actually work in your community. Another example of this is, the, is, is courts and adversarial style courts in particular, because all of those are part of these the systems that the federal government thinks are required for access to justice, but there are communities in Alaska that don't have fully developed adversarial courts. They still use village councils, which has worked over time for them. Um, and what you end up with if you have to adopt these types of, of systems is you have to adapt or change in ways that may or may not work for you. Um, and that has huge downstream effects 
on culture and community and how things work out, and in my opinion, justice and what you think justice is. Um, so I suggest that cultural mismatch can be avoided if Alaska Natives are empowered to develop justice systems that reflect their community values. And I think one of the unique things about Alaska is that there's an opportunity to do this, to actually develop justice systems from the ground up and implement cultural sovereignty in their design, rather than being in the situation that most tribes in the lower 48 find themselves in, where they are either trying to um, integrate their traditions into existing court systems because um, the United States imposed adversarial style courts on them at the end of the 1880s and they are still transitioning away from that um, or because um, they were desperate to exercise jurisdiction and just adopted state law without really thinking through it and are now um, you know, 20 to 30 years into a developed judicial system trying to figure out how do we make this work for our people because we borrowed from the state and it turns out not only does it not really work for the state, but it really doesn't work for us. Um, and so I think the fact that Alaska is at a point of developing their systems, it gives Alaska Natives a real opportunity here um, if they can be empowered to do it without having to constantly meet the conditions um, that the that other governments set out. Um, so in short, what my paper basically does is it argues that Alaska Natives have to craft justice systems that reflect their cultural sovereignty and their own views of justice in order to resolve access to justice issues in their community. So. Um, thank you. I'm happy to answer questions and look forward to having a conversation with Alex. All right, so we'll start with our first question. So as both pieces explain, these gaps have been left by the absence of state provided resources. Um, and so how have Alaska Native justice systems adapted to fill these gaps specifically? Well, I think um, like many questions about Alaska, there's not a single answer. Right, every region um, approaches, uh, I don't wanna say problems, but approaches issues uh, informed by cultures that may be very different, right? So uh, there's not a monolithic Alaska native culture that, that I'm aware of. Um, and so I think that regional approaches uh, can vary from region to region. I think that um, some regions, uh, the regional nonprofit and uh, health and social services provider, uh, particularly in the interior, has prioritized supporting tribal justice systems for the last 40 years uh, because that was what the tribes in that region wanted. They wanted that kind of regional support for hearing cases, for, uh, you know, addressing some of the challenges, like you mentioned around due process, right? We have, um, and I think that at its core due process is this idea is like nothing without me or nothing about me without me. You gotta tell me you're gonna talk about me and you gotta tell me what you're gonna talk about. And I know that we could get, you know, um, some federal statutes or state statutes might get a little more persnickety, but that is the basic idea that you gotta tell people you're gonna have a, a discussion about them and something that they care about, such as their children, and give them an opportunity to be there. Um, but I digressed a little bit about approaches. So I think that uh, throughout Alaska, there are many tribes uh, who have tribal councils that are sitting as courts and hearing cases. Um, this idea of a separate branch and co-equal branches of government um, doesn't really align with traditional ways or modern ways about how tribes govern themselves. And um, I know that that idea might make some people uncomfortable, right? In a Western system, we are very much taught that you should have three separate equal branches of government. Each one of them kind of has a lane and they should stay in their lane. Um, and uh, that's not uh, how many tribal courts in Alaska are functioning, but 
you know, for what it's worth, I personally am not uncomfortable with that. And let me share some of the reasons why I think that, that it works and it makes sense. One, as we've all been talking about, there's not a lot of lawyers. And two, lawyers don't always equal justice. Uh, and when councils are hearing cases, it's more than one person making a decision. And we recognize the wisdom of that for our appeals courts, right? It's usually more than one judge, isn't it three? We recognize the wisdom of that for our Supreme Court. It's nine of them making a decision, not one. Um, and I think that that translates well uh, and recognizes, I think, so I've served as a pro tem judge both in Alaska and in California, but I've never judged in the community that I live in or amongst my own people. And I don't want to do that. Uh, and I think about the challenges of making a decision in a community that I live in with knowledge about um, all of my extended family being part of my decision making and the wisdom of having three or five people make that decision collectively, I think stands up, right? You have more than one family that's represented on council you have more than one person making a decision. So if the decision is a hard decision, if it's a decision to remove somebody's children, there's not just one person who's getting hard looks at the community store. Right? And also, I think we all recognize that, you know, three or five heads are better than one. They may be coming up with solutions uh, that not just one person would have thought of. Um, there are other regions in Alaska, Southeast in particular, that have a very robust written tribal law with, um, you know, different uh, levels of appeal court. Um, and uh, that's a very different, again, way of approaching justice uh, than perhaps in other parts of the state. There are tribes in Alaska that also have um, established or as needed have inner tribal courts or appeals courts to hear cases. Again, this idea of more uh, deciders at the table being better and making a stronger decision. Uh, I guess that's a long way of saying uh, the lawyer's favorite answer, which is it depends. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of different approaches for what works. Kirsten, did you want to speak to that question? Um, that's fine. Okay. I'm not sure I even remember the question. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, so, I guess with the next one's for Kirsten then. So what are some potential consequences of introducing adversarial systems? I think one of the things about adversarial systems is that they're constructed on a certain set of assumptions about the relationship between an individual and a state. Um, and that assumption, in my experience, doesn't always hold in Native communities. And as Alex said, every Native community is different, and they have different um, ways of doing things. But one of the things that I've, I've noticed and that concerns me about borrowing and implementing it is that I've seen kind of two things happen in the lower 48. One is that... Um, people's expectations of their tribal government is not necessarily the same as their expectations of the state government. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have different relationships within their community. So Alex was talking about how he would never want to sit on the, the, um, the court in his community. And I, I absolutely understand and agree. I think it would be very, very difficult, but it's, but that's because the relationships are different and how relationships are thought about are different. And when you have an adversarial system, there's not the same understanding of those kinship relations. And when you are trying to impose that in a community and the individuals are still functioning and thinking about this as these are my relatives and I have expectations of them as relatives, Think about that. You don't have the same expectations from the state as you do from your relatives. And I think that leads to a disjuncture, which then makes people in the community much less satisfied with an adversarial style tribal court than even an adversarial style state court. Um, and one of the things that we just don't know enough about is 
tribal citizens' relationships and expectations of their own government. And I, it's something that I think is, is you know, broader than the conversation today, but it's part of the concern, right? And I really like Alex's point of like, if you have a number of judges, right, it really changes the dynamic because all of those people have different relationships with the individuals coming in front of them as the judicial, as the decision maker. And so they're gonna bring different things to the conversation. I think that's why um, things like critical peacemaking sometimes work is because in peacemaking, there is no decision maker. The idea is to get the community members to come to a solution, but you always have more than one representative from the community facilitating it because that they bring the different relationships and ideas. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Alex. Uh, so when discussing the definition of village in relation to Indian country, how does this tie into the broader conversation about tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction in Alaska and sort of what's its significance? Sure. So as I, I tried to lay out, so in the Violence Against Women Act uh, of 22, uh, the sections that talk about Alaska take into account that there are not reservations here, uh, but there are villages here. So it's actually, it's kind of a two-part determination. Um, the first being, is the tribe federally recognized? So are you on the list of uh, that's published every year? And um, right now, I believe there's 229 tribes on that list in Alaska. Um, and then second is the village that the tribe is associated with included in the list of villages that was in Anxa. There's not a hundred percent match to that, but it's pretty close, right? And, um, you know, each region kind of has their reasons for that. And then there's a reference out to uh, the Alaska Native Village Statistical Area which is a, a map that the Census Bureau puts out and is responsible for putting out each year. Um, so it's kind of a three part, you know, three different places you've got to check. I think it's significant because it was a way to address this need for defining an area within which tribes were recognized as having full civil and criminal authority. It did not tackle the fight over Indian country in Alaska. And I'm not saying that that fight's not important. There are land into trust litigations happening right now. And, um, and you know, those may continue for another 20 or 50 years. But what the definition of village in VAWA did is it said, we're going to address public safety without having to answer this other question. And I think that that's an important way to address a problem. Um, and I was thinking as Kristen was talking, right, about this idea of, you know, there's there are these requirements in 813B in the pilot project, and you've got to meet these federal requirements to have criminal adjudicatory jurisdiction over non-native people. And we can still be building or supporting tribes who are building systems that reflect culture and tradition. I don't think it's an either or an or. And what VAWA 22 did was it sidestepped the question and said, keep figuring out the issue about Indian country, but we're gonna focus on public safety. And we're gonna do that by crafting a definition that answers the legal questions about whether or not tribes have jurisdiction over native people within the village. Um, and in, in that way, it reminds me of some other uh, civil rights issues I've seen in my lifetime, right? Um, Same-sex couples used to not be able to get married, but for many years we had civil unions. And so my sisters had civil unions before they could get married. They didn't say, I'm not gonna do a civil union until I can get married, right? And I think that this is the same kind of um, idea that we can be doing both at the same time. We can accept what we've got and really take advantage of what's on the table right now with the affirmation of tribes jurisdiction in Alaska. And we can also support and continue to try and build systems that are more reflective of 
of the ideals and the cultures of the communities. Thank you. I'd like to open it up to the room uh, if anybody has any questions. Virtual questions too. <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, I'm curious about the issue of adversarial systems because my experience is that more often than not, the issues that arise over tribal <coughs> decisions, tribal court decisions, play out in full faith and credit and comedy arguments in the state courts. And in Alaska, those full faith and credit and comedy arguments impose a clear adversarial system. And I was wondering uh, what your thoughts on how to, if, if we move away from the adversarial systems in tribal courts, um, how would that interplay and what would be necessary for the state to accommodate that? Well, I guess, uh, you know, my first response is thinking about, you know, you highlighted full faith and credit and comedy and how a tribal court or justice system got to a final decision doesn't always involve an adversarial system, right, or a hearing. Sometimes it might, and sometimes hard decisions do need to be made, um, particularly when we're talking about uh, child welfare or... Um, family violence and safety. Uh, that full faith and credit though in comedy system, that is a state you know, or a Western idea, right? Of full faith and credit being you know, essentially the state is taking a sister sovereign's order and enforcing it as if it were its own. And it's that enforcement of the order, I guess, that maybe you're highlighting as being adversarial. Um, but I don't think that that necessarily applies to the proceeding that came before it. it is, I think the problem yeah. is, if I understand your question correctly, I think the problem is that a lot of times you can't get full faith and credit of a tribal court decision if the tribal court didn't follow an adversarial proceeding. The, the problem is, I think you, I think you um, Alex, defined due process wonderfully. I, and I think that's right. I think that's why it's so open. I think the problem is that when you get into a full faith and credit review or a comedy review, when, when the state court is asked to enforce a tribal court decision, the problem is the state court gets really, really nervous if it doesn't think there was due process below. And because our state systems are so infused with a certain notion of due process. Due process looks like X, which is an adversarial system with two lawyers who get to adjudicate it on their behalf, that what happens is this, this is the loophole, right, by which tribal jurisdiction gets, I mean, it just gets eviscerated because then the, the state court won't recognize it, even if the community itself recognizes it, because you've got this cultural disconnect between what the community thinks is due process and fair and how they define it and how the state court are being asked to enforce the judgment defines it. Um, and you talked about one way to alleviate this would be through a court rule. Um, which I think is a great idea. And the question is, how do you draft a court rule that explains that the due process has to suit the community, not the adversarial system or the state? Like whose determination of due process matters is kind of what the question is. Um, we have a court rule in Michigan. We don't take this into account mm -hmm. <laughs> at all. Um, the assumption is that for a tribal court judgment to be enforced, the tribal, it has gone through a, an adversarial process. Now, I do know we have some tribal courts. Um, the Little River Band has a very robust peacemaking program, and all of their peacemaking decisions are then enforced through Little River court orders. I don't know of any of them being challenged, though, or asked to be enforced in state court. 
Um, but that's where you would start to see this opening for the change. And the question is, could we innovatively think of ways to write court rules that could protect the community itself's view of due process? I guess I also go back to the guidance that we got in John V. Baker about particularly about due process, right? That it doesn't need to look Western. So I'm only aware of a only aware of one written decision that ref where the state court refused to recognize a tribal court order because due process concerns were not met or due process ideals were not met. And in its language in particular about due process, uh, the court gave us the guidance that it doesn't need to look like our system, right? It doesn't need to like tribal due process does not need to look exactly like state of Alaska court due process. Um, and that they weren't going to tell tribes exactly how they had to give, give notice of hearings. Um, and that the hearings needed to be held in a regular fashion, but they weren't going to get into what the details of that looked like. Um, and so I just, I haven't, and, and it may be that I'm not aware, but I haven't seen a lot of other challenges to tribal jurisdiction be accepted. Uh, within the Alaska court system, particularly on the basis of due process. That ends our time, yeah. I think that ends our time for now. Um, so thank you everyone, thanks to our panel. Um, thank you, Alex, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. All right, we're going to switch over to our second panel, so we'll have those panelists come up. <laughs> yes. Assumption that also in your question that. How are you? I'm How are you? all right everyone we could return to our seats while we get some food and coffee <laughs> Can we dim the lights a little for the all right well um so our first panel for sharing your insights um that was wonderful uh we're gonna turn to our next two speakers who will discuss the role of technology in expanding legal access in the court um so uh, jj prescott will present his research next steps in online courts expanding access to justice through court technology in conversation with Jeannie sato uh, Professor Prescott is the Henry King Ransom Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. His research interests involve, uh, revolve around criminal law, sentencing law and reform, access to justice, employment law, and the dynamics of civil litigation, particularly settlement. Much of his work is empirical in focus. Professor Prescott also spearheaded the development of Matterhorn, an online platform now available in more than 20 states and more than 100 courts which helps people facing warrants, fines, and minor criminal charges resolve their disputes online, often without the need for legal representation. Matterhorn also offers online dispute resolution to individuals with small claims, landlord, tenant, and other civil disputes. Professor Prescott earned his JD from Harvard Law School and his PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. 
Jeannie Sato has been the Alaska Court Systems Director of Access to Justice Services since January of 2020, overseeing the court's family law self-help phone line, self-help web pages, dispute resolution programs, court forms, language access, state jury office, the eviction diversion program, and various access to justice technology projects. She came to Alaska 30 years ago to clerk for the Alaska Supreme Court and never left. She clerked for both the Alaska Supreme Court and the Alaska Court of Appeals and worked for Anchorage Youth Court and the Alaska Public Defender Agency before transitioning to family law in 2007. She practiced as a family law litigator, mediator, collaborative attorney, and parenting coordinator until 2018 when she joined the Alaska court system as the Justice for All Grant Project Implementation Manager. Thank you, Allison. Um, we've been asked to keep the microphone close for the folks on Zoom, so hopefully I'll do that. And if you can't hear me, let me know, because uh, historically I'm very bad with a microphone. <laughs> so I wanted to thank everyone at the Duke Law School and um, Law Review for having us today. JJ and I have spoken. I'm going to go through some slides, and then he'll go through some slides. And then we have some questions that we've made up as a pretend moderator would ask us. And then we'll maybe have some time for you all at the end. Um, So, see if this works. It just worked. You can click on the, click on the slides since you. There we go. Thanks. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of development about the Access to Justice Department at the court and my involvement with it. I started doing contract work for the court in about 2018 under a grant, and it involved a couple of tech projects. And the grant actually stemmed from the project Nicole was talking about earlier, where the court did some mapping and in. Mary Kimmel, who will speak to you later, worked on that before I joined. And um, the projects we worked on were building some debt um, case forms and FAQs and information for people because that was one of the areas where there's a great civil um, access to justice need and the court didn't have resources. And the second project was a tech project that was funded by Microsoft originally, and it was to build something called a legal navigator platform. And I'll talk about that a little later, but that's where I started at the court. In late 2018, Stacy Mars became the administrative director of the court system, and I took her position. And at that time, I was the director of self-help services. But under Stacy's leadership, the court has really focused on two primary goals. And one is making sure that every person who interacts with the Alaska court system has excellent customer service and that we do all we can to make it easier for every Alaskan with or without an attorney to get access to justice. So during that time, since um, I started in January of 2020, um, we've moved from self-help services to access to justice and the department has grown through a variety of means, including combining different departments into access to justice and using some grants to expand some of the services we offer. I think when we think about technology in the courts, we think about all the new bells and whistles and generative AI and all sorts of things. But for me, the court really looks at using technology, all sorts of technology from the most basic to the most complicated to try to provide access to justice. Um, what I'm going to try to share today in my opening remarks is how has the court historically used technology to expand access to justice and what new technologies are we um, trying to expand to use now? And I'll explain sort of what I see as the spectrum of how we use access to justice programs and technology to help self-represented litigants. Um, although we do have fax capacities, I'm starting with the telephone, mm -hmm. and that's some of our most basic services. And for those of you who live in Alaska, you know that we rely on the phone a lot in court. And even prior to COVID, Alaska court systems had a lot of telephonic participation. Um, our Family Law Self-Help Center uses the phone, and we do not meet with anyone in person. And that was an intentional choice to ensure that we provided the same services to everyone statewide, no matter where they were, or if they're on the road system or had access to attorneys. Um, we um, don't meet with people in the offices. We serve everyone from one location. And then after the phone call, our facilitators can email or mail parties the things they need, depending on their capacity and, and capabilities and technology. And we can also send links or direct them to different parts of our web page. 
We also have a pretty robust series of self-help web pages with a variety of different case types. And each section includes FAQs and basic information, as well as forms and links to the different court forms that self-represented litigants can use. Um, one post-COVID technology that we've taken advantage of is Zoom. And we offer a couple courses statewide now, Zoom. They're both family law oriented. And every other week we have a family law education class that many unrepresented litigants are required by their judge to attend. And once a month we have a webinar, uh, I mean a meeting format, Zoom, on hearing and trial preparation class to help parties without lawyers prepare to comfortably be ready for a trial. Um, the rest of our programs, or let's see, <clears throat> we also have our co-parenting program that is post-COVID. This is a hybrid program where we combine internet and Zoom. And parents who are struggling with their co-parenting and maybe need some tools and a way to learn how to work together post-separation can um, take an online six-unit course at a discounted price. And we have court staff who are mental health professionals who can provide three free coaching sessions to help them practice their tools. So that's a way we're combining a couple different sorts of technologies. Um, then moving to what I think are a little bit more exciting technologies that are newer and in development. Um, we have started building automated forms and probably like many people we're trying to recreate that awesome TurboTax experience where people can answer a series of questions and have a form produced at the end that tells them what they need to do. Um, this is in its early stages, and we're hoping that when it's fully developed, we're going to be able to connect it through an IP to our online filing system so that parties could get on, answer their questions, have their form, and um, file it with the court. Right now, they're still having to either download it or email it to themselves. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, Legal Navigator Microsoft project I mentioned at the beginning. That was one of the first projects I was brought in on. And it was a grant-funded project um, that Microsoft was sponsoring with a, quite a few national organizations. Hawaii and Alaska were the, mod, the two states that were selected to try it. And we spent a number of years. And um, ultimately, the project didn't turn out the way everyone had hoped. But the part that we were most excited about was an interview option on this platform where parties could go through and the, the goal was sort of to simulate what would happen if you were talking to someone on the phone or in person. So unlike the TurboTax experience where you're giving it all, you know, your real detailed information, you're answering more narrative questions. So if somebody was starting a divorce, they might be asked, do you have children? How long have you been married? Have you separated? Do you have property and debt to divide? So instead of it's more like a, a conversation would be. And at the end, you get a personalized action plan that has steps that can be expanded. And it, it's supposed to direct you as if you clicked through the web page and found everything exactly as you needed. We're bringing you right to that information. And this can be downloaded as a PDF. It can stay on your computer or you can email it to yourself, the action plans. Um, so when the Legal Navigator project ended, we decided to try to recreate this ourselves. And this is actually our recreated version. This is not the Legal Navigator version. We were lucky enough, um, well, we learned about a free, um, a, a free code source pro product called DocAssemble. And we were able to find a person to hire who was an expert and had a lot of experience in DocAssemble. So we've been building, rebuilding this interview platform from the back end and coding it. Um, and it, it, we've had a lot of great support from the folks who work with DocAssemble and their document assembly forms, but we've been building it in a different way. So we're um, really hopeful that when we're done, a lot of other courts can adopt it since it is an open source free coding. Um, and I, I did wanna mention one other thing. So this is a project we built ourselves and JJ is gonna be talking about online dispute resolution platforms in his experience and the Alaska courts. And that's a program where we have hired a vendor. And it's been very experienced to see, it, interesting to see the difference, the pros and cons of hiring a vendor and building your own. And, and JJ built his own ODR platform um, because there, there's a lot of time and expertise needed to build your own, but you have a lot more freedom. And with a vendor, you really have a lot of restrictions, but you don't need to hire a full-time coder to be on your staff. Um, 
the one thing we've noticed in both directions is that it takes a lot longer than you think. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Another project we're pretty excited about is a chatbot. The National Center for State Courts solicited courts who are interested in a generative AI chatbot. So unlike some chatbots you might see with different vendors that have pre-programmed answers, like our interviews have pre-programmed answers, this will be a generative AI chatbot. And the National Center for State Courts selected us. It should launch by the end of the year. We looked at our Google Analytics and we chose probate estate case types to do because that was one of our highest sought out web pages and we don't have any online resources or, or telephone resources for that. So that's one thing we're excited about that should be launching soon. Um, oh, and I don't have a slide for this, but we also are working on um, a civil case hearing text notification system. We do have a vendor who helped with a statutorily required criminal case text notification, but we've been building in-house with our IT team um, our own backend for civil case reminders. And so we're hoping that's coming. There are some challenges with all the restrictions of making sure people opt in and how do you get people to be aware of that and opt in. Um, and then this is a little outside of tech, but it's a shameless plug because we are currently um, I'll, I'll probably talk a little later with the questions about some um, traveling we're gonna be doing, statewide outreach we're gonna be trying to do about all these resources. And we are working with an outside vendor right now to do some branding and testing of all these products to try to put them together into a suite and maybe have a name or idea or a mascot or a theme. So we will be looking for testers. If you have anyone who would like to hear about it or see them or provide feedback, please let me know, I have cards. So that's my shameless plug. And then I think I will turn it over to JJ, and then when he's done, we'll answer some questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, oh, okay. I needed to mute. That happened to me right before I started. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry. Um, I'll just uh, start off by uh, thanking the Alaska Law Review for. Uh, not only inviting me, but then dealing with my very slow uh, pro uh, progress on on the paper. Um, I am also not from Alaska. I'm bringing an outsider's perspective, like Kirsten, and I'll add that um, I've never been. I have been here for the last uh, you know twelve hours, and um, I have always been fascinated by places that are farther north. I grew up in Southern California and I've just moved to colder and more Northern places over and over. I've only gotten to Michigan so far, um, but, uh, but it's really a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna talk um, about my experience with ODR and what Alaska is doing and, bring, and try to bring my outside perspective um, on what they've accomplished and hopefully um, offer a few observations and questions for thinking about it in the future. I, I need to, um, in addition to thanking everybody, let you all know that I, 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 did, I did build my own ODR system years ago, more than 10 years ago now, and I, I got out of that business. I'm not really involved in it at all, but the University of Michigan continues to make me disclaim um, whenever I talk about ODR. So I'm, I'm doing that here. Um, I will also talk about some of the research that I've done that comes out of Matterhorn that I think is relevant for thinking about what ODR might be able to do in Alaska. Um, so my perspective is a little bit uh, different than Jeannie's. Uh, she's kind of what all um, law professors wish they could do more of. She's in the trenches actually working with people, working with courts. I, I come from a uh, more of an outside perspective. I'm an empirical economist. I work with a lot of data. And, um, and in my perspective, when I got into this uh, uh, field, I, I really, it seemed to me that access to justice was really kind of defined in two big areas. One relates to lawyers or navigators or people resources and how we can get people access to those. And the second was more about the challenges that are created by where things are, by places, like where courts are or how you figure out and discover certain types of things. And, and really my, my interest in the last 10 years has been what can court technology really do uh, to help about this. And court technology, in addition to all of the advances that Jeannie just talked about, I mean, for a long time, of course, courts had email systems and ways to do research and so on. Um, but it really was about 
how to do things inside the court. And just in the last few years, in addition to all these resources, we see courts kind of taking advantage of the fact that there are now these things called platforms where people can engage and exchange information and communicate. And that has really made it possible to think about courts that no longer operate as a place where something happens, but really as a set of services where people can come together and, and interact. So um, this is now happening in Alaska in the form of AKODR. Uh, this is what you'll find if you spend some time on their website. It's a portal where you can negotiate a resolution for your dispute, request help from a neutral mediator to resolve your dispute, and request a court order, depending on whether there's a case eventually filed, um, uh, to, to actually potentially enforce that later on. Um, it's been around for less than a year, and so there's a lot of open questions. Um, I originally was excited to look at some data. Turns out that, that you know, there's just... There's still a lot um, happening there, a lot of changes and a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of learning going on. So, so this is going to be mostly about thinking about what they're doing online and commenting on that. So for those who aren't familiar with online dispute resolution, and again, I don't, I don't know how, um, how much you all know about this, but it is essentially a, an online space where people can resolve disputes. Usually, at least to date, it's been mostly about negotiation and sometimes mediation. Um, but it could indeed involve actual adjudication where there's a third party making a decision. My, my experience uh, with this really started with, with traffic. So this is actually the kind of thing you get in Michigan where you get pulled over and you get a ticket and they say, listen, you don't have to pay this ticket. You can make an appointment and come down and negotiate the ticket. And I said, well, why can't we just negotiate that here? I'm like, well, that's not really what we do as police. We over... We oversight you, and then you go down and deal with it. Um, and uh, I used to put a picture of my daughter, who used to be was in the car with me at the time. And I got this because apparently I was very polite. And I'm like, well, what do you, you know, what do you expect? My daughter was in the back. But uh, so the 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 idea here is that, you know, a law professor, I can take a day off work and go wait in line for four hours. Um, but a lot of people can't. This is where I had to go. It looks nice and um, welcoming, I suppose, in a way. But but ultimately. Um, this is a lot about lines. And so this is a little bit different maybe than what many Alaskans in their communities are facing, but at least in terms of thinking about the origin story of ODR, a lot of it has to do with these kinds of lines where you go down and you spend all day to spend um, 10 seconds resolving something. So my meeting actually took 10 seconds. There was a piece of paper. The prosecutor looked at it and said, I can give you impeding. I said, I'll take impeding. Thank you for wasting my entire day. Um, and, um, and you won't be surprised to, to, to make the further leap that this, this winds up hurting people who are disadvantaged much more than people who can take the day off um, without um, losing hourly wage work or, 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 or dealing with child care and so on. And of course, there are a lot of people who don't even go. They just pay the ticket because they can't afford to actually challenge uh, the ticket. So this is, this is one of the starting points. For me, I became interested in the space because of um, outstanding warrants for failure to pay fines and fees. Um, I do a lot of criminal justice related work. Turns out millions and millions and millions of people in the US have outstanding warrants mm -hmm. because they don't have enough money to pay tickets, uh, which then turn into fines and they are scared to go to court. They don't know how to resolve the issue because they're too poor. And so they exist in a world where they have outstanding warrants, which of course deny means you have no fourth amendment rights and you, you don't vote, you don't call the police. There are all sorts of problems that come with that. But I thought, well, why do you actually need to go to court to resolve this if it's mostly about just getting on a payment plan? And that starting to talk to courts led to um, an interest in courts with traffic uh, and even some minor misdemeanors. So that was the start. Um, but that made me realize that actually there are a bunch of challenges to using courts as a place. So not only are there the economic and physical costs that come with taking time off to go to work, transportation, childcare, um, pressure from your boss not to go, consequences for going, lost wages. Of course, there are psychological. I'm, I'm a lawyer and a law professor. I still find courts super weird and intimidating. Um, I, 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 I got to believe that if you're not a lawyer, it's more inti intimidating. And if you are from a, a community where the people working there don't really look like you and don't speak like you, it's even more intimidating. Um, you're expected to walk in and talk in public in front of a bunch of people about your issue. A lot of times that's explaining that you're 
too poor to, to deal with the issue. Um, so, so there are lots of reasons why people just wind up opting out. Of course, there are systemic talks as well. So there are disparities that result from in-person interactions in these systems. Um, having bunches of people all assembling in a single space is also not always great. Um, during COVID, we came to realize that having ODR software and ports made a big difference. Um, there are legitimacy concerns when you walk out of a hearing and you don't even know what just happened because you were so anxious the entire time that you, you couldn't even pay attention. Um, so, so as a result, we have a lot of people who feel left out in the cold. Um, courts are not there. Even if they know what the law is, actually physically going there is a problem. So the idea behind all this technology is just to, just to do it online. And then it becomes a design problem. How do we make it easy to access? How do we make it easy to use? Um, this is an example of a, a simple private party ODR workflow. Um, it actually winds up uh, pretty uh, great with what uh, Alaska is doing now, but you have, these are pretty small, small um, uh, font sizes, but not surprisingly, you, you kind of do what you would do if you were in a normal uh, dispute resolution stance. You just kind of do it online where you have um, some back and forth going on. Um, we set this up in Michigan. Um, it started being adopted by lots and lots of different courts, and now you have ODR in the U.S. that is all over uh, the, the, the place. Multiple states, multiple companies now that serve this. Almost every company that sells case management software is also doing it. Um, so lots of different case types. And the focus of first-gen ODR, and I can talk to you about what I think uh, second-gen ODR will be like if you're interested, but it's really just replicating what's going on in courts to the extent possible without all the costs and confusion um, that, um, that we normally find there. Okay, so what are the impacts? And this is really just to, to kind of highlight what we might expect to happen in Alaska as ODR expands. Um, you get a lot of people who really love this. Does everybody love it? No, of course not. But of course the courts are still there for people who want to go in person. And there are a lot of people who find this way of interacting to be much more pleasant. Um, you can you can look at a bunch of different metrics. Um, what do people, how do they react to it? How much time do they save? Are there people who can't go at all, who, who wouldn't have been able to go? So here, for example, um, people who use um, ODR often report that, well, if this wasn't available, I just, I wouldn't have been able to go at all. Um, uh, you can find that cases are oftentimes resolved more quickly. And one of the interesting things that you can also notice is that actually, when people start using ODR who are comfortable using it, it actually sort of cleans up and reduces some of the, the load uh, for people who actually want to continue using um, in-person, face-to-face services and courts. And so there's some uh, spillover effect in that, that way. Um, ODR can allow for a lot of disputes to be resolved before they become more costly for everybody. Um, so you, you wind up... Uh, having uh, fewer defaults, so you actually get outcomes that are based on the substance rather than uh, the, 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 the fact that somebody just made a claim and somebody's too poor or too stretched to actually make it. You also see that a lot of warrants and hearings that are set up just to get people to show up to resolve the issue uh, start to disappear. Uh, and there's some evidence too that um, people wind up being treated somewhat differently uh, in a world in which you don't have to show up face to face and show, you know, your class, your race, your gender, and so on. Okay, so um, you can think about ODR from two perspectives. What's it providing to the courts? And what's it providing to people? Um, we have, uh, from the court's perspective, you know, if you're trying to convince a court to, to do this sort of thing, you focus on faster dispositions, the workflow is more manageable, Courthouses can be safer. It allows people, instead of constantly explaining the same thing over and over again, to actually to, 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 to routinize that. And there can be more consistent, uh, consistency in treatment. For people, though, there are just a zillion different um, upsides. Okay, um, Again, not for everybody, but sort of by and large, it seems like for those who are using it, um, it's a real um, added advantage. Okay, so what is going on in Alaska now? Well, we have new um, ODR here in Alaska where... <clears throat> Alaska is offering uh, ODR for small claims and debt collection cases uh, between private parties, all right? And, uh, and in the article, I, I kind of in, interrogate, I explain and describe some of, the some of these choices and some of their pros and, and cons. I welcome any feedback you all have um, after 
uh, taking a look at it if you do. Um, but the focus is for now on disputes between private parties. A AKODR essentially right now includes a negotiation platform and an opportunity for mediation support and adjudication, which got me really excited because I'm still trying to verify this because I, I, you know, I'm not, there's so much happening in this space that I don't know everything that's going on. But in the US, to my knowledge, there's not a way to actually have a third party um, neutral decide a case based on asynchronous text-based exchanges, essentially a trial by chat, if you will. And, um, and Alaska is at least um, uh, exploring this option. And it's a really exciting one, I think, especially for people who have difficulty accessing uh, the courts. Okay? So what's the, the path? Why is Alaska um, headed in this direction? Well, of course, you know, as, as Jeannie made clear, Alaska has many of the same access to justice problems that I just described earlier. Uh, but on top of that, um, there are distinct challenges in Alaska related to its low population density and very spread out communities. Um, all of you know this more than uh, I do, uh, but the, the main takeaway is that actually getting to a court to take care of things, to access that sort of service is just really difficult. And it's difficult, not in a you know, random way, but in, in a way that affects certain communities in a much more serious uh, sort of way. So, so how is this um, gonna work? Well, um, I actually spent some time exploring it, and I just I want to say it's as it's designed, it's really easy to get started. And in my own work, I found that you know if you if you ask too many questions at the beginning, it's just a turnoff. And I don't think you'll be surprised to learn that you all sign up for things all the time online, and um, really all you need is a name and an email address, and you're ready to go. You can you can add in a postal address as well. Um, uh, but it takes very little time. You can be up and running on the system in less than five minutes. So um, once you sign up, it's possible for you to, to, to take advantage of existing court databases by identifying a case that you have filed. If you're a plaintiff or a claimant, um, I, wanna, I wanna negotiate with somebody about that case or I wanna mediate that case. But if um, you don't have an actual case, you can create a new one. So one of the things I really love about this um, system is it's set up to help people negotiate before they get to court. There doesn't need to be a case filed. It is here and available for Alaskans to actually make progress on a dispute. Um, one of the comments I'll, 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 I'll make later is that I, I wonder why it's not available for all types of disputes. Why limit it to small claims or uh, debt collection if um, somebody's tree falls on my fence and I want to use this system to negotiate it, um, it's kind of a burden for me to think about whether that's a small claims case or what kind of case is that. Um, you know, Alaskans could use this potentially without, um, without even having to put a name on what it is that they're arguing about. Okay, this is what you have to do in terms of um, filling it out. So you have a thousand characters to summarize your dispute. That goes to the other side. So here I, 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 I hired, I claimed I hired myself to do some work and I never showed up. Uh, and, um, and so you can see that that uses roughly 20% of the space, easy to do, easy to, um, to think about. Then you make a choice about whether you wanna go into a negotiation space or a mediation space. You can always escalate later into a mediation if you want. Um, one question is whether or not we should, in thinking about designing the system, start with negotiation all the time and expect people to try that. There are arguments on both sides. We might think that you've already tried to negotiate and maybe you don't, you don't want to try it again in this place or alternatively, maybe there are safety or other kinds of concerns, ways, you know, things that you're worried about. It's just not, doesn't feel safe to not have a third party there. Um, but right now, AKODR allows you to make this choice at this stage, which I think is, is great. Um, the descriptions are really intuitive and helpful, and it, I think they're designed for, um, for people who are trying to solve their problems. Okay, so then you have a chance to upload evidence. This is great. At this point, I decided I should use this against my son, so I uploaded a, an uncompleted merit badge requirements document to show um, why he uh, should not have access to computer time to play Elden Ring uh, on Saturday until he uh, completes what he owes. Um, but it's very straightforward. And then you essentially begin the negotiation by adding an individual or an organization that you are bringing this claim against. So um, you can uh, select the participant. Here it's going to be a respondent. And then you start. Okay. And that's it. 
Um, there are a bunch of opportunities, I think, to improve this going forward, adding case types. Like I said, maybe no case type should be required for negotiation. People can just use it as a space to help solve their problems. Um, but family disputes and minor disputes with the government are an obvious place to go next. There's a ton of existing um, work in that space, and it was, it's likely to make uh, a big difference for people who can't otherwise get to courts. What about um, a few of the other limits on the system? So one of the things that AKODR stresses is that it's entirely voluntary. It's entirely voluntary. You don't have to use it. But I want to I want to suggest that when it's entirely voluntary in a private dispute, what that means is the other party always gets to veto using the software. If you want to try to negotiate, they don't have to. It's not available to you. And so thinking about ways to maybe subsidize or encourage or maybe even start it as the default is a way to potentially go. Um, at this stage, too, only claimants or plaintiffs can initiate ODR. This is not true in other places. So if you're sued in small claims court in the US, for example, in, in Ohio, where I have some uh, experience, um, you get an invitation essentially to start negotiating online if you want with the person who just sued you. And um, they don't, that, that comes automatically. They can refuse if they don't want to, but you at least can uh, try. Um, the great thing about uh, the system though is because it's so open and easy to use, my guess is it's going to be much easier than a lot of systems have been to scale and to test and improve. I'm also going to point out that for a state that doesn't have a law school and is looking for ways to increase the people power, uh, the fact that on online mediators might potentially come from the lower 48 seems huge to me. Uh, there are existing ODR uh, uh, clinics in the US where there are law schools who are essentially trying to teach their law students to mediate and do this sort of thing. And, and all of those mediators could, these student mediators could come and work and help Alaskans resolve disputes. Uh, and I'm really excited about adjudication going forward. So some big questions, that, that's all I have, by the way. And then we have some big questions that uh, uh, Jeannie and I wanted to, to, to offer up. And I'll, maybe I'll just put them out there. Um, uh, and we really wanted to focus mostly on the on the first one, like, and I think it's a huge issue both in ODR and with all these other resources. People think about going to court as a thing you do, and you would not even necessarily know that you could negotiate with somebody online through this system. Um, it wouldn't occur to you. So how do we get Alaskans and people more generally to become aware of these kinds of tools and to start uh, start using them? I want to address that, but before I do, I want to um, thank JJ for all his help on ODR, and we were, you all witnessed this sort of um, interesting dynamic where the Duke Law Review found an expert to tell ODR the, you know, what the, he, an expert thought about our ODR platform, but it's all public. So here you all are seeing as we're getting our feedback, and two of our ODR <laughs> platform people are here today, and it's been great working with JJ, and we're really appreciative for all his feedback and his thoughts on this, and some of the things, you know, I think because we're working with a vendor. We don't have all the freedom, but it's we've been really um, appreciative that this turned out we got a lot of expert information about this platform as we- And, and thank you for being so open to working with me. Always, I mean, it's been it's been amazing. Uh, and it, it, side note, it worked out perfectly because my son just transferred to University of Michigan. So we got to meet in person. In person and everything. We met in person, he toured the campus with me. I, I moved my son in, so it's been great. <laughs> Still first time in Alaska, though. We were meeting about Alaskan ODR in Michigan. So yeah. was... um, But so this is my second shameless plug. Uh, as Mayor Kimmel will talk, I don't know if you'll touch on this later, but she worked with the court. Nicole mentioned our justice system mapping, and I talked about that first Justice for All grant we had. And part of that was really working on a justice ecosystem and how we leverage all the other service providers in the state to help us get the word out about what the court can do to help people receive access to justice. And the community justice workers came out of that initial research. And now we're um, now that we're finishing our interviews, we're at the point in the process where we will be traveling throughout Anchorage and the state to talk to different people about this suite of services that we're getting newly branded. And um, so if you are aware of people in Alaska, um, social workers, police officers, librarians, schools, churches, anywhere in the state that you think might want someone from the court to come and do a presentation on these services, please also let me know that because that's the next phase of our access to justice work that we're really excited about and, and we're just right on the cusp of that. So for me, how we're trying to get the word out is by um, tapping into the whole 
ecosystem of other providers, informational providers, um, such as librarians, people at schools, people at churches, uh, law enforcement, the village uh, safety, the village VPSO, village medical, protective safety. Medical, medical care providers seem like a place you should also consider. Yep, and that was part of how we got working with ALSC and the community justice workers. And the, um, so it's informational uh, education or informational law enforcement and the medical. Those are the three groups of providers we're looking to try to work with and build relationships to get the word out because it um, it takes a village, it takes a justice ecosystem to get more people aware. Maybe, maybe when a case is filed with the court, the court could automatically just send an informational sheet to the parties. So we do have, right now it's on our small claims summons and we're testing with small claims and um, district court debt and hoping to learn kind of a lot of those tips and tricks um, and, and test how it goes before we expand. We do want to expand to a lot of other areas. Yeah, one, one challenge I ran into is I'm dealing with old warrants, people who you know, have who've had failure to pay fines or fees for more than three years. Um, courts don't have any information about that. They can't find those people. And, um, and it's really hard when you have a new service or a new opportunity to find people to let them know, at least for some certain types of case types. Right? And then on the, on the digital divide, it is definitely an issue everywhere. So changing space and place uh, for using technology. Not everybody's comfortable with technology. Not everybody has access to the internet. I did just learn, and I just added it to the paper, that now um, iPhones can now text through satellite without access to the cellular system. Uh, also, Google Pixel phones can as well, um, which makes me realize like there are going to be continue to be technology changes here, and we might be thinking about SMS adjudication and negotiation uh, going, for, I mean, I suppose most people right now negotiate by text anyways for almost all their daily activities. Um, uh, but if it's really the case that in the next year or two, if you have an iPhone and then soon maybe Android devices as well, you can, without a cellular uh, network, communicate with the core uh, using uh, text-based uh, text -based communication, it seems like a game changer too. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. I came in late. However, uh, how are you getting this information out to rural Alaska residents? It's good to hear that, um, you know, you're looking into SMS because most of the uh, my relatives in northwestern Alaska do not have uh, internet access or computers, all they have is they don't have landlines anymore because to cut back on um, uh, bills, they only have cell phones and most of them are basic. Have you gone to regional hubs, Nome, Bethel, um, Dillingham, Fairbanks and regional hubs? Um, that's the travel we hope to start in 2025, that we have um, grant funds to go to those locations. And so what we need to do between now and early next year is find people in those villages or those locations who would be helpful in uh, helping um, host us to talk about these and have an afternoon or a couple hours. So if you know of folks in different villages who might be interested, I'd love to get some of that information from you or your contact information. Do you have time for a question from the chat? Yeah, one minute. Okay, real quick. <laughs> Is there a way that the system verifies that claims being brought through the ODR system are not part of a system to defraud people through fear tactics or other frivolous claims? Um, so that was one of our concerns, and that's part of the optional um, platform. But it's interesting because when we toured and uh, showed the platform throughout the court system before we launched, that was one of the things the Supreme Court was very felt very, very strongly about. And so we worked um, very carefully to try to make sure that if, if somebody starts a case, an email goes to the other party. And we have tried to put it very clear, bold letters this is optional. This you do not have to do this. Um, to tr that's been our best bet to date on how to or our best bet to date on how to address that concern. Is trying to be ensure anything that comes from the platform is very clear in articulating. You do not have to do this, 
And um, to date, you know, the cases have slowly been trickling in, and we are also right now um, monitoring. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, there, there, there are going to be potential. For, I mean, it's the problem is that it has the imprimatur of the, the courts on it. At the same time, um, you know, in other ODR circumstances, there's a lot of questions about uh, just falsification, right? Like, you know, or identity verification. This is an issue that's come up. Identity verification turned out to be much less of an issue in courts than I would have expected. Um, but people do think that it's easier to lie by text than it would be if you're standing in a courtroom. I don't know whether that's true or not. However, some systems actually make clear that if you make statements through a system like this, uh, then um, there can be consequences to lies. You're essentially lying uh, to the court. And um, I could imagine that uh, there are some, uh, you know, these aren't gonna work really well, but they're, 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 they're at least the starting point. And it's a little bit different than getting a random email um, uh, uh, this would have uh, at least some some backbone behind it if people misused it. I think we're out of time. I'm sure we're both having to answer questions. Yep, I'll be here. After. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all so much. So we're going to have a brief break. Um, there is some food outside, so you're welcome to go grab some lunch and bring it back in here. And we'll start the next panel in 15 minutes or so. So um, take this opportunity to move about and we'll reconvene about 1110. <laughs> platform because people would want to perform your time. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I got a board. I got a ring to with Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I I know, I know, I know, I know, That's right. That's good.
they're the one in the first and like the, the, the it's hard to explain. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, please. Okay. Now that we can use my husband, like I can't. I do think we can whenever he wants to see Yeah. Without clicking off it. No, I think real time terrorism without a no, I I was like you know, I was talking to but I like this is more Side yeah. conversations, yeah. like people give them. Like, <laughs> you guys are about to pick up the speed. Like, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
say that somebody who has been out of plan or sight unseen by moderators and other student actually explains or different at the scale of last year. They have the ability to set up as part of the all and I block that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and but it's in a way to so I understand that. It's not a query. I'm not going to do that. Uh, 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 and just like, oh, my God, I don't I don't know. I do I don't I don't know. I do No, I'm teaching remotely. Really, I don't and we had um but it's the meeting of the same group so yeah yeah, I don't think I don't have any kind of I'll just be there. I should probably make sure that Right. Before we even have our first meeting, we're going to have our first meeting. I was going to say, you should call your own. Yeah, she loves it like that. I mean, I have a about it. Oh, it's about old range. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you wrong? Why are you all good? I mean, that's like I feel like I do. I think about it. I don't know. 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 I
I'm sorry, I'm trying to move out here. No, it's the corporate council section. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started if people can keep sort of settling in and stay on track today. Um, our next panel is going to talk about accessing environmental justice. And moderating this panel is Sharice Arce. Sharice joined the Earth Justice Alaska Regional Office in January 2023. Prior to that, she served as an assistant U.S. attorney in both the districts of Arizona and Alaska. In 2015, Sharice was selected as the first ever Gay El Tenoso Indian Country Legal Fellow, part of the Attorney General's Honors Attorney Program. She worked in the Tucson U.S. Attorney's Office and the Pasqua Yaqui Prosecutor's Office, where she was assigned to the Indian Country Violent Crime Section. In 2018, Sharice transferred to the Anchorage U.S. Attorney's Office, where she served as the Tribal Liaison and prosecuted white collar, environmental, and wildlife trafficking cases. She received her law degree from Seattle University School of Law. And I'll turn it over to Sharice to introduce the panelists. Hello, good morning. I think it's still morning. Um, my name is Sharice Arce, and I am from the village of Iliamna. Um, so I'm an enrolled tribal member, so I'd like to start with that. I'm also a mother. Um, so it's interesting when we make these introductions, it's often titles and things like that, but where what's important to me is where I come from and um, my family. And I'm very, very honored to moderate this panel. It's 40 minutes long, which I don't think is nearly enough time to um, give due diligence to the esteemed panel I have here today. So here to my left, um, I have Vai Wari. Vai, and she's um, from the native village of Savunga. She's a tribal citizen. She's also a mother and a grandmother. And since 2002, she served as, she has served as the environmental health and justice director. And in her role, among many things, she coordinates environmental health research projects in the Norton Sound region of Alaska and supervises the work of community researchers on her island. She was appointed by President Biden in 2021 to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. I will talk more about that later and ask some questions about her role there. Um, she also serves as a leader on the Global Indigenous Peoples Caucus that advises the United Nations international delegates for treaties concerning persistent organic pollutants and now on the current plastics treaty. She has, I'm not, can't even encapsulate all the different awards she's won, but just a snippet is that she's been awarded by the Alaska Native Tri Tribal Health Consortium um, on Environmental Achievement. And she's also been awarded by the Rachel's Network Catalyst Award for Women and Environmental Leaders of Color. Um, tonight, she is being inducted into the Alaska Women's Hall of Fame um, for her lifelong devotion and um, to hold polluters accountable and for the well-being of her community. So it's really an esteemed honor to have her. Next, I have Teresa Klemmer, and she has been practicing environmental and natural resources law for 25 years. She's currently serving as the legal director at Trustees for Alaska, which is a public interest environmental law firm that works to protect Alaska's wild spaces and address climate change for future generations. Before joining trustees, she worked in private practice and ran her own solo practice law firm here in Alaska. She also spent four years at Vermont Law School teaching environmental law courses, publishing in academic papers, and directing the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Clinic. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in political science from Princeton University and received her law degree from Georgetown University. And so we're so excited to have Teresa here too. Next, we have Carol Hawley, and she is the managing attorney of Earth Justice's Alaska Regional Office, which is based here in Anchorage. She has been working on environmental issues throughout her career, which included service as an assistant U.S. attorney, a special assistant U.S. attorney for environmental crimes, the environmental crimes prosecutor for the state of Alaska, and co-director for Pacific Environments Alaska program. 
She was also a litigation associate at a national law firm devoted to representing Native American interests. She also served as an adjunct professor um, at the University of Alaska Anchorage here, teaching environmental science. And she also received her bachelor's in international studies from the School for International Training and a master's degree in environmental studies from Evergreen State College. And her law degree from UW, University of Law School, um, University of Washington Law School. So there we have it. That took up about five minutes. So now we need to just go right through. So kind of how this is gonna work, we're gonna start out with an, um, Carol, who's gonna give a brief overview on what the legal framework or what environmental justice is. So Carol, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, thanks Sharice. Uh, and I asked her to come okay. down, oh, it's off, on, and again. Closer? Uh, okay, thank you, <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, I have the unenviable task of defining and summarizing the history of environmental justice in about 10 minutes, mm -hmm. so uh, we'll do that. Um, <laughs> Environmental justice has been around for decades. The concept of it has been around for decades, but it didn't really rise into national consciousness until the late 1970s, early 1980s, when in uh, Warren County, North Carolina, a environment or a hazardous waste landfill was planned to be constructed in this small town of Afton, North Carolina. Community members weren't consulted. They didn't know about it. They found out about it and found out about the 6,000 trucks that were to be laden with soil that were, was um, contaminated with PCBs and raised some issues. They had concerns that uh, the PCBs could leach out of the soil, could contaminate their groundwater and their drinking water. And so they raised this to agencies. They raised this uh, concern to state and local governments, and they were ignored. And so they took those, the, the lessons learned from the civil rights movement, connected with others in the civil rights movement, and planned protests and civil disobedience um, actions around the opening of that hazardous waste landfill. As the trucks were driving down the road, community members, these are just like everyday folks who go to work every day, just want to put like food on the table and get their kids to school, laid down on the road and blockaded those trucks. So you can imagine the picture. Imagine the picture in the newspaper, in the news stories of these just, just regular folks laying down to protest this contamination of this pollution going into their communities. There was a lot of litigation. There was a lot of administrative uh, uh, actions to try to stop this. Unfortunately, the communi community members of Afton, North Carolina lost, and that hazardous waste landfill was uh, opened, that contamination was placed there. But on a larger note, we started a national discussion about what is environmental justice. And communities across the nation saw a pattern erupting they saw that there were these inequities, these disparate impacts that were being placed in communities of color, communities that were socioeconomically depressed, and reports were made. Uh, the General Accounting Office, which is now the Government Accountability Office, put out a report that demonstrated that eight southeastern states uh, of the United States had an overwhelming number of hazardous waste sites that were placed in communities of color in socio socioeconomically depressed communities. This uh, rising or raising of national awareness and consciousness led to an executive order in 1994. Then President Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 12898, what called the Federal Actions to Address Environmental Justice in Minority Populations and Low Income Populations which provided a definition for environmental justice and created and made it uh, a directive or a mission of federal agencies to actually come up with a strategic plan for how to address environmental justice in regard to the obligations that they have within their agencies. So first, just a little bit uh, about the actual defini definition. Environmental justice in the, the executive order, there were 
or different um, definitions that have been put out over the years, but in the executive order means, quote, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Now, there are two pieces of that definition that are really important. Uh, the first is fair treatment. And what does fair treatment mean? <clears throat> fair treatment means that no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial or government or commercial activities. So that fair treatment piece is important, as well as the part about meaningful involvement. Like those are the two really cornerstones of environmental justice. And meaningful involvement just isn't that traditional like one way public relations that you hear from a government or industry. It means that government agencies actually have to go out and seek the populations that may be affected by an action and talk to them. And not just talk to them, but hear about their concerns, consider their concerns. And those concerns could actually make a change, could change the direction of that uh, government decision. We don't necessarily see that, but it, they are directed to do that. So that's the, the first place that you really see um, environmental justice encapsulated in uh, federal directives or guidance. EPA, and as I said, this is, wasn't just for EPA. The EPA Environmental Protection Agency is in charge of our environmental statutes, um, policies, regulations, but it also applied to, for example, the Army Corps of Engineers. They have to incorporate environmental justice into any decision affecting navigable water bodies. The BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, has to consider environmental justice when it's determining whether oil and gas activities should be allowed on federal lands. So it's really, this directive is extremely important. Um, the EPA, as you can expect, has actually done more with this directive than other agencies. Uh, not to call out NOAA, but NOAA just finalized their strategy last year, and that's nearly 30 years after this executive order came out. But EPA has a number of really good um, resources for people to look to. They have the EJ screen, which is a GIS mapping app, um, application. And I think uh, Vi knows a bit about that. And it's, uh, it helps agencies and industry identify if there's a community that might, um, have a, there might experience a disparate impact from an activity. They also have guidance on environmental justice in Indian country. They have implementation plans. And you can find that all on the EPA's website. Um, it's a really helpful tool. In addition, following Executive Order uh, 12898, uh, Environmental Justice Carol, can I inter interrupt you? You've mentioned the term disparate impacts, and I'm hoping that you can kind of bring to light what disparate impacts mean yeah. in, in the context of here, possibly in Alaska. And I know Vi can probably talk about that as well. Absolutely, Sharice. Thank you. Yeah, so disparate impacts, for example, you know, if we go back to the example in North Carolina of the hazardous waste site being placed, um, that happened, for instance, in a community, and I did forget this, thank you, a, a community that was primarily low income and black. That was the community. It was noted in all of those reports that came out from the government, from uh, Dr. Robert Bullard published a book on it, that you would never see a hazardous waste site like this placed in an affluent white community. You're not gonna see it because they have connections. They have connections to the law. They may, they may be lawyers, they may be policymakers. So they can affect change where poor communities, so socioeconomically depressed communities, uh, communities of color don't, did not necessarily have that impact. So when we're talking about disparate impacts here in Alaska, for example, um, you will find communities that, uh, are more frequently experiencing contamination from um, military, old military defense sites. We have a lot of formerly used defense sites here in Alaska. Um, I think over 700 that need to be cleaned up. 
So those are the types when we're talking about disparate impacts, you'll find that communities of color, socioeconomically depressed communities will be more frequently targeted or experience environmental injustice um, than other more affluent communities. Thank you for that. And I think it's important to set that stage and bringing it back to the, the idea of meaningful access and what that means, you know, accessing justice. So just wanted to flag that. Really, thank you, Sharice. I appreciate that. Um, and so then there have been, we've had additional executive orders. Environmental justice has kind of been in flux, unfortunately. The Trump uh, administration tried to get rid of the Office of Environmental Justice and the EPA, but President Biden recommitted to environmental justice. Uh, he issued uh, a couple of executive orders, 14096, uh, just issued last year, which was in particular revitalizing our nation's commitment to environmental justice for all. And then executive order 14008, which is tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, which in particular has a section devoted to environmental justice. But no, we don't have any federal statutes that are just geared towards, these are directives, they're guidance, but we don't have statutes covering the like environmental justice, you know, is an enforceable thing. Um, we don't have a state uh, law as well. What we have are these guidance documents and we have some provisions that you'll find in very, the Clean Air Act, in uh, uh, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RICRA, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act. So there are provisions in various environmental laws, but there's not anything specific. So would you, would, would you say that these are more an aspirational, these, the concept of environmental justice is more aspirational than actually like a, something to hold a legal accountability to? Yeah, uh, yes. I mean, I think there are yes and, uh, or the legal act answer is it depends. <laughs> Each of the executive orders have a specific clause that say this is not legally enforceable, right? But there are some cases, um, specifically like with the Environmental um, uh, Administrative Board or the Administrative uh, Appeals Board for administrative actions that has said, well, you are supposed to take into account environmental justice. And so there are some decisions that are better than others. Um, but there, you can see it. There's also other types of cases, like there's tort cases, there's civil rights cases under Title VI that also could take into a pat, uh, um, take into account disparate, disparate impacts. But and in, in the context of Alaska, so Alaska is warming faster than any other state in the United States. It's causing you know detrimental impacts to the ecosystem at large, leading to the increase in wildfires, flooding, coastal erosion. Um, which impact a multitude of things, including subsistence practices. So considering these changes, like why do you think environmental justice is important or how could we be using these, um, the guidance, the executive orders in, in the context of, the, of how Alaska is today? Well, so I'll give a, a short answer and pass it down. Uh, so I think environmental justice is extremely important. You'll see, you, you look at, um, for example, the EPA's uh, environmental, um, the, the, the mapping software, and you look at a map of Alaska and too often it's, we don't know, we don't have enough information. And, um, and we know that there are people who are affected, there are communities who are affected uh, by these disparate impacts across Alaska. And we need to do more to uplift those issues and because people are suffering. Um, and so let me pass it down to Vi. Um, thank you. Uh, I have to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Pangwinghak Vai Wakai. I'm the daughter of the late John and Della Wakai. My appa uh, was from Bunguk Island and Gangirami clan. My Nungyok grandmother. Ayuklik is from the Wali clan, and I'm the youngest of six children. I'm a Sivorok Yibik grandmother, and um, I'm sitting here taking notes of all the agencies that uh, that are supposed to look out and and look for out for our health and well-being, and um, pretty much all of them have failed my people. 
um, we have had our own community-based project on Sivokak, which is our traditional name for St. Lawrence Island. I doubt St. Lawrence Island. Mm -hmm. I, I, I doubt St. Lawrence has ever been to our island. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're trying to decolonize our names and place names, which is Sivoka. And um, it's been very difficult with my community to hold the polluters accountable, which I've come to learn is one of the large. Try this one. Um, and can you start out by explaining what the pollution you're referring to is? Um, of the, there's 700 current and formerly used defense sites in Alaska. And we have two on Sivoka because of our proximity to Russia, the Air Force came and built two bases. We're closer to Siberia than mainland Alaska. My people welcome the military. My grandfather and father volunteered for the Alaska Territorial Guard. Our people help rescue downed Air, Air Force planes. And we, you know, my father served in the Alaska um, National Guard ranked, he worked 25, 30 years and retired and, and um, you know, worked up to be a ranking member. And um, there was an agreement, uh, an agreement signed in 1952, Native Villages Savunga recognized the importance of this agreement to protect our lands, airs and waters at Northeast Cape, one of the two former bases on our island. Basically, that agreement stated that we wanted our lands turned back in the same condition as when we turned them over. We had a community there that is now displaced. We have identified PCBs, pesticides, heavy metals, solvents, massive fuel spills up to 220,000 gallons that we know of. And you know, I generally say the burden of proof was put on my people, but at the um, Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee for the Plastics Treaty, I met and talked to Special Rapporteur uh, Marcos Orellana, because that's generally what I'm, I, the 22 years I've been a, a community researcher. And when I share our story, I always include that the burden of proof was put on my people. And he informed us that we should not have to show causation, right? Here I am, I've been sharing our story for 22 years. I have to recover because it's so personal, the health harms that we're facing. It's not a matter of if we'll get cancer, but when. The environmental racism um, you heard about in the, the community that Carol mentioned. Environmental violence where we're being contaminated without our consent. With them failing to honor that agreement, they violated our basic human right to health, our human right to food and subsistence free prior informed consent. These are good mechanisms. However, we work on chemical policy reform at the state, national, international level. Recognizing now that the Arctic is a hemispheric sink for persistent organic pollutants, we are able to discern Contaminants that arrive into the Arctic through air and ocean currents from local sources with the military abandoned. PCBs have 209 congeners. The heavier ones are from local sources. The military abandoned. And lighter ones come through air and ocean currents. And then um, an example of these pops, a, a, a farmer in South America applies the pesticide on his crop. Within five, seven days, it ends up here in the Arctic, it's ending up in our, in our um, lands, waters, wildlife, in our people. 
My people have four to 10 times higher PCBs than the average American in the lower 48. The failure of the Department of Defense and the Army Corps Army Corps of Engineers, who was responsible for the site characterization, identified 32 form, uh, sites of concern at Northeast Cape. And on the other end of our island, Gamble, the other site, where we can see Russia from our window. Um, <clears throat> the school, the playground, the municipal buildings, the homes are on top of the waste site. They buried everything there. I have hours and hours of footage from elders that when they came, they brought everything they ever needed for 15 years. And all they had was their backpack and rifle. And they failed to honor the agreement at Northeast Cape on the other end of our island. They abandoned everything. Here they signed the agreement that they would uh, remove everything that they ever bought, but to save funding, they abandoned everything, two, 300 personnel. My father helped build that base. He worked there. He had to pay his own way from Nome because we had moved to Nome when there was no high school on Sivoka. The hospital in Nome kept sending him home. He died from cancer. He had to pay his own way. By the time we found out he had cancer, it was too late. My mother had a stillborn child after me, heart disease, strokes, diabetes, and cancer, and mental health harms. We buried my brother to cancer two years ago. I'm a cancer survivor. I've had three miscarriages because my mother and siblings, we spent every summer for five years at Northeast Cape. These are all health harms we linked to PCBs. All the health harms we're seeing, heart disease, strokes, diabetes, thyroid disease, um, on and on and on are all linked to PCBs. That's one chemical. But we, as I mentioned, PCBs, pesticides, heavy metals, solvents, and what comes here through air and ocean currents. It's not a matter of if we'll get cancer, but when. Alaska has two times more birth defects than the lower 48. Our Alaska Native infants have even two times more than birth defects. And now microplastics. We, re we produced this report to inform the delegates at the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee at Committee 4 in Ottawa. Industry outnumbered the delegates and NGOs. State Department, United States Department and EPA sent 40 staff. Career staff I've seen in Geneva, Switzerland five times, working diligently to oppose the listing of toxic chemicals to be banned globally at the Stockholm Convention. We're at the Plastics Treaty to weaken the language of the, the Plastics Treaty. We have history of petrochemical. Uh, we're heavy. We're a state heavy dependent on the petrochemical industry. We give subsidies to these industries. There's a long history of historic mining, petrochemical industry, uh, 700 current and foreign use defense site, proposed new. Most people think Alaska is the last frontier and pristine. Most people have no idea we're hemispheric sink for pops. We're hemispheric sink for pops. And now the Arctic Ocean has the most microplastics of all the oceans. We need a change from the markets. There needs to be a market shift. You can tell I'm very passionate. But, um, you know, it's... It, you can see this report, I brought some copies, but you know, I, I'm all about educating, especially this, the people here, because this is on the face of injustice. Chinanbai, you're not, I'm not done with you, but in the context of what, how do you 
obviously you are a part of, you know, the the Biden, um, the WeJack. Can you talk about how you, you know, access environmental justice and meaningful engagement, which is part of these executive orders? How do you do, see that happening um, for your community? And for people that may not have the opportunity for these platforms to be on, for example, commissions or have the direct connection with agencies, how is environment, what does env accessing environmental justice look like for them? Um, I'm serving my second term. I'm the only Alaska vo Alaska and Arctic voice on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And um, it's an opportunity, uh, President Biden uh, passed an executive order, just uh, Justice 40 initiative, to ensure that 40% of all federal resources go to disadvantaged communities, recognizing the in, uh, injustices we're facing in um, this nation. So uh, it was established to, um, to ensure that we, it was, um, it, as I mentioned, there's long standing history of environmental in, injustice in the, in the nation. And um, Carol, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Carol had a great uh, terminology for um, EJ communities who have been overburdened. And um, as far as uh, the WEJAC, I've served on the climate and economic economic justice screen, um, to, I'm sorry, yeah, I served on the climate and economic justice screen tool to help identify disadvantaged communities. Also on the climate planning, I, I was opposed to the title they gave it, climate adaptation and resilience. We should not be adapting, right? Our elders recognize 50s and 60s, the pending climate crisis we're facing now and resilience. Every, you, when I hear that, I'm tired of being resilient, right? <laughs> it doesn't address the root cause that we've been facing. So also I serve on the Indigenous People and Tribal Nations work group to, uh, to um, work to ensure the priorities across Indian country. Some of the most disadvantaged communities facing environmental health injustice, environmental violence, environmental racism. And I'm also pushing for a um, military toxics work group because it's the feel, first time I've ever feel that I'm being heard. The 22 years I've been doing these, I have been co-leading a community-based participatory research project. I learned early on that I needed to be at the top of my game. We're against the largest polluters on the planet, multinational corporations driven by greed and profit. And it's so it's an honor to work like with Robert Buller that you mentioned, um, Beverly Wright from Cancer Alley, all these people working from grassroots communities, communities like mine, giving advice to ensure that the most disadvantaged communities get 40% of all resources coming out of all federal agencies. We rec make recommendations to the Council on Environmental Quality, who give, then give advice to the intergovernmental agencies, all the federal agencies. So it's, it, you know, change is hard and slow, especially holding, you know, we're up against some of the toughest and worst violation uh, per, uh, in the violators in the nation. And um, it's, it's so difficult. However, I know this is my calling and I know I'm supposed to be where I am today. I wanted to hear more about this community-based um, participatory research and how your work, you coordinate environmental health research projects in the North Norton Sound region. Why is it important to, to ensure that local locals are engaged in data collection? We are a small nonprofit woman-led organization here in Anchorage. All of our board are women, majority of them Alaska Native women. 
We partner with two of our tribes, Native Village Gamble and Native Village Savunga. They help design the research. We don't have our own agenda. We have um, elders, youth, um, grandparents, parents give us advice and guidance. And um, in the beginning of this project, our people got our blood tested first because a former health aide, Annie Aloha, recognizing high rates of low birth weight babies, miscarriages, stillbirths, and cancers in our families that lived at Northeast Cape. She tried to get help for our people for 20 years. It fell on deaf ears. Got sent to agency to agency in 20 years, came around full <laughs> circle with seven agencies. We are continuing her work. She was a well-respected elder. So um, we hire and train local people. We're on the ground collecting all the samples ourselves. We have 19 peer-reviewed journal, published journal articles and publications. I ensure that our academic partners uh, recognize the importance of our indigenous peoples knowledge which is on par or even greater than Western science, that uh, our community health researchers are co-authors and that we are on the panels as experts when we go to uh, venues like this to share our uh, community-based participatory research project. We provide it so our people can make informed decisions. Our leadership want us to share this, recognizing we're not the only community who um, lives adjacent to a, a formerly used defense site. Or, um, and we share this at the Geneva, Switzerland for the Stockholm Convention. We bring an Arctic Indigenous People delegation. We're instrumental in helping to ban toxic chemicals with our CBPR. And our current project is protecting future generations. Because when we did our first P, uh, PFG project, it was to do research in our adults, recognizing how these toxic chemicals can affect our, our reproductive systems, our ability to conceive, our ability to carry our children, our ability to have a healthy child and birth. And when we went home to report those findings, we heard concerns of our children having the lowest test scores in our, the Bering Strait School District. That was very alarming because our people have relied on indigenous people's knowledge for millennia, all science-based, how to predict the weather, the migration patterns of the wildlife my people have relied on. We have 90 words for ice. So it was alarming. How can we pass on our languages, our creation story, our songs and dances, our culture and traditions, and continue life of Sivokokipik people if our children are being, they're endocrine, they're be, the threats to all of these I mentioned from endocrine disrupting chemicals. Chinon Vai, and I just hate to interrupt you because I could listen to you um, on and on. Um, and this is, it's so important for us to have Vi here because it brings into context how environmental, environmental injustice and how there's been a struggle for in accessing environmental justice. And so in the con I wanna kind of shift now um, to Teresa here and I'd love for Teresa to talk about potential solutions. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. I'm looking at the clock. I see there's only a few minutes left, so I will try to be quick. Um, but I, I think Vi gave us a great segue because um, one of the themes that you talked about was how the burden is on you and how you've done all this work for 22 years with no, <clears throat> um, you know, with not enough response anyway. Uh, and so I have some thoughts about ways to flip the burden to industry and to the polluters, uh, both with respect to new projects that are being proposed, new mining projects, new industrial development, and also with respect to existing contaminated sites that have been around for far too long and haven't been cleaned up. Um, with new projects, uh, free prior and informed consent is a principle that has been established by the United Nations in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, known as UNDRIP. Uh, the United States has not adopted this principle or, or implemented it in any meaningful way, but Canada has. Uh, so to, you know, if you speak to an audience of Americans, they say, oh, that's just aspirational, that's not really being implemented, but it is in Canada. Uh, they have domestic implementing legislation and most of the provinces have provincial legislation implementing it. 
And what that means is that mining companies, when they want to develop a project, they have to go get free prior informed consent from communities before they start polluting communities. They, they, the community has to say, well, what's in it for us? Uh, so if you, there, there's a great map um, on uh, the Canadian government's website that shows across Canada, there's uh, about 200 impact uh, agreements with communities that would be affected by the mining that is being proposed in their communities. And um, one that I happen to be familiar with is in the Nunavut territory. Uh, the Kikiktani Inuit Association uh, is a group of 13 indigenous governments, kind of analogous to Tanana Chiefs Conference or, or one of the INCSA set up nonprofits. Um, and they've negotiated with Baffin Land Mining Company, a very um, beneficial agreement uh, relating to the Mary River iron mine uh, gives Inuit authority over environmental impacts through an Inuit committee, an Inuit steward pr program, stewardship program. Uh, they ha they implement an adaptive environmental management plan informed by traditional knowledge. The Inuit QIA people carry out monitoring of the land and water with funding from Baffin Land, but they are in charge of it. Uh, in it includes on-site monitors, baseline food studies, um, and all kinds of things. And they're they're well funded, and um, they have a real leadership role. They also do social monitoring. They get paid millions of dollars for interruptions to harvesting. Um, they uh, get uh, funding for gasoline to enable um, harvesting for communities that are engaged in it. Um, they also have a share of the actual profits. They get royalties uh, starting at 1.2% and then increasing to 3.3% over, you know, as the mine is being expanded. Uh, it's been estimated that the value of this is 1.2, uh, excuse me, billion dollars uh, in royalties for the community. Imagine what these small communities can do with that money in terms of their public health and addressing the negative impacts from mining. Uh, there's research and training and daycare and like so many other things under this agreement. It's really like they threw in the kitchen sink. Um, that's, that just shows what happens when you have some actual negotiating power because the burden is on industry to, to convince you to let the, this come to their community. With respect to existing contamination, um, it's uh, very challenging. We have, uh, as, as has been mentioned, 700 or so um, military sites, but there's also hundreds of oil and gas related sites and mining sites throughout the state. Um, and the tools have been just uh, completely ineffective. We have statutes like CERCLA and RICRA that are supposed to respond to um, environmental contamination and facilitate cleanup. There's only about five or six sites that are on the national priorities list and are getting the full blown CERCLA treatment for cleanup. There are a couple dozen sites where there's private cleanups, um, you know, facilitated by the law, but there's dozens or hundreds that have not even been investigated yet. Um, both statutes have citizen supervisions and RICRA, uh, and both statutes have imminent hazard or imminent and substantial endangerment provisions. RICRAs can be initiated by citizens, but the problem there, like toxic tort liability, is causation. You still have to show under the imminent and substantial endangerment provision all the steps in the chain from the pollution to your disease or to the public health threat. Um, but I think one encouraging avenue that could be used to address this are there's examples of legislation in recent years where Congress is finally figuring out you just can't get meaningful response to toxic contamination without dealing with the causation problem. We've seen this in the PACT Act, which uh, relates to veterans who've been exposed to contamination overseas and at military bases in the United States. Um, basically, these statutes are it's starting to become more routine that you get a list of conditions where the harm to you is presumed. If you have conditions on the list, if you lived in an area or served overseas during a particular time period in a particular location, the burden then shifts to the government to say that you were not, your disease is not caused by the contamination. Um, and so that opens up avenues for uh, coverage of, of health costs and um, benefits for families that are uh, survived people who have died from these contaminating issues. Um, and the, also the Camp Lejeune Act includes a couple of other things, not just causation, but also statutes of limitations and government immunity. All the hurdles to litigation can be dealt with through legislation. So with that, combined with some sort of abatement power, uh, like we've seen in RICRA, if you could get legislation combining those principles of um, the power for citizens to seek their own abatement of contaminated sites and the re reduction of these hurdles to um, be able to succeed in court, then you might be able to actually break through the struggles that Vi and others have been fighting against. 
Thank you, Teresa. And we're um, just about up here, but I think this was um, great because we want to end on a positive note. It can be depressing, you know, thinking about just in the environmental state of the world. Um, but, you know, with um, indigenous knowledge, the fact that, you know, in our legal work, we often cite to studies like, you know, publications like this. And if it comes from, you know, indigenous people who are on the ground and then, you know, knowing about the other models and, and a vision of what could be, I think um, that is what we want to leave you with and to envision a better world. I think we could possibly open it up to questions um, if I get the okay. Is that all right? Or you? One question. So does anyone here have a burning question or anyone online have a burning question? Got one question here online that I can try to summarize really quickly. Um, says, I wonder what you think about the long-term environmental justice aspect of the federal allowance for the state of Alaska to apply a flexibility act that removes standard landfill regulations like liners, leachate collection, and monitoring. This law and regulation is in existence today in the laws. Regarding the environmentally threatened landfills like Shishimarefs that is eroding into the Chukchi Sea. I'm sorry about this pronunciation, by the way. Shishmaref and the Chukchi Sea. Yes. Um, and new talks eroding into the Niglik River are releasing toxic waste, including plastic, to subsistence resources. Anyone, does anyone want to tackle that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, go ahead. We, we have um, unlined line, landfills. All they did was camp. So um, these contaminants know no boundaries. And there's some of these chemicals in the landfills are forever chemicals, right? So as indigenous people in the state who rely on our wildlife, intricately tied with our wildlife, it's, it's, it's unfathomable, unfathomable, I'm sorry, to, to uh, understand how these, like the military or industry can do these practices that are not protective of our health and well-being. They don't live by these contaminated sites. And um, so these toxic chemicals can leach into the groundwater, into soil, into plants and berries, um, but also the wildlife that rely on um, um, like um, uh, the, the our tundra that rely on tundra, you know, it's, it's, it's a crisis we're living in already. Uh, we're seeing species die off uh, in our fish, bird, plants, and seal. My people rely on the ocean. Our elders call it our farm, but it's, it's just, I can't imagine a, a, a multi-billion dollar corporation not take measures. They know that the, uh, that these chemicals are toxic, but they don't make put measures in uh, place to protect our health and well-being. I'm so sorry, but we're up against time. But um, Vi has left some great brochures that are available over here, and then we are all available for questions. But we're going to have to move to the next panel. Thank you guys so much. We can have our next group of panelists start to move up to the front. We'll get set up. Mic check, mic check. Yes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you to our environmental justice panel. That was wonderful. Uh, we're going to transition to our panel now on uh, power conscious advocacy. And our moderator today is Rick A. Haskins Garcia. Rick serves as the director of law and policy for the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center. He moved to Alaska in 2018 and has dedicated himself to serving Alaska tribes by providing training and technical assistance to Alaska tribal courts and justice systems. Prior to joining the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, Rick served as a tribal justice facilitator with the Alaska Native Justice Center and the tribal justice director and associate general counsel for the Association of Village Council Presidents in Bethel, Alaska. Rick also had the honor of serving as the district court magistrate judge for the Alaska Court System's fourth judicial district. And I will turn it over to you to introduce our panelists. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. Um, good morning, everyone. Rick Haskins Garcia. I had a full introduction plan, but I think Allison kind of went over it. So um, I, I did want to share a little bit about the work that we do at the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center for those that aren't familiar. Uh, we're an Alaska Native statewide tribal resource center that was initially designed to help tribes with resources and training and technical assistance to address gender-based violence in their communities. So we provide tribes with training and resources uh, development of their programs at the tribal local level, um, but we also do a lot of justice components. So we help tribes develop their own tribal justice systems. Uh, we're helping a few of the tribes in Alaska develop their own tribal criminal law. Um, so putting that in a little bit of perspective, but um, I'm so excited today to share the stage with Antonio and with Christine, uh, where we're talking about uh, power conscious legal advocacy, power conscious lawyering, um, in the work that we do each and every day, being trauma-informed, being victim-centered, and that place-based advocacy that Christine and Antonio are going to talk about are so important. And when we think about our Alaska Native communities, our tribal communities, our off-road, mostly rural communities, uh, the place-based advocacy becomes even more important. So I'm going to let uh, Christine and Antonio introduce themselves, and then we're going to pass it on to Antonio to kind of continue on. Uh, good afternoon. I think it's just about there. Um, my name is Christine Pate. I'm the legal program director for the Alaska Network on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Um, very uh, uh, pleased to be on this panel with um, my co-panelists. Um, the Alaska Network on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault is the statewide coalition of 24 community-based um, domestic violence and sexual assault programs. Um, we are uh, in Utkiadvik, uh, Prince of Wales, on Alaska, all around the state here in Anchorage, um, Awake and Star. Um, at the coalition, we do many things, um, but at our legal program, um, we do primarily two things. Um, direct services um, for survivors of domestic and sexual violence around the state who need civil legal assistance, um, and that is primarily ends up being in the domestic relations area, arena. Um, and we staff those cases through um, both volunteer attorneys and uh, staff attorneys. And then we also do uh, uh, training and technical assistance to our community-based advocates around the state who are on the ground doing work in justice systems to help survivors in the civil, civil and criminal justice um, system. Um, so just a brief overview in, in ways that's relevant, perhaps, to our discussion. Hello. Okay. And my name is Antonio Coronado. I use they, them, a pronouns. I'm going to save all of us and not read all of these things. But uh, I want to apologize for three things right up front. One, which is that I know we're right after lunch, so we're inheriting some of that post-lunch crunch. Two, apologies for the mayor of Whoville Green that you've been dealing with all morning. <laughs> Thank you for rolling with it. Um, and three, that there's a lot of logos up here. None of them are about Alaska. So you're probably wondering, who is this person? What are they doing here? What are we talking about? Um, and so I am happy to share this, this space in talking about power conscious advocacy. Um, I serve, as you'll see on the paper, like three different roles currently. <laughs> Um, but I am the Community Legal Education Lead at Innovation for Justice, a social justice legal innovation lab jointly housed at 
University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law, and the University of Utah, David Eccles School of Business, which is the long-winded way of saying my nine to five is working, thinking, and being in service of community to build the community law school, and my five to nine is doing all of the paperwork to make it happen. <laughs> so uh, I think a lot, I write a lot, and I research a lot about legal empowerment. Um, and so, so much of the threads that have been coming through across today, I'm very excited to be in conversation about. And I'm passing it back to me uh, to ground us in this space a little bit uh, before maybe to get centered from lunch. I'm also bad at mics and realizing to ground us post lunch. If folks want to join me in a quick mindfulness activity, this is a practice that entered my community teaching um, at the start of the pandemic and has continued with me in physical and virtual spaces. Um, so for folks that have never practiced mindfulness before, or have never done check-in kind of activities, it's gonna seem cheesy. Bear with me, I promise, it'll be worth it. So I'm gonna get situated exactly where I am seated. I encourage folks to get situated wherever they are seated. For folks that are on Zoom, wherever you're joining us from across the many places. Um, and I'm gonna stop talking actually. Uh, to bring all of us together in checking into this physical space um, from the many different physical spaces that we might be coming from, visiting from, um, or coming together on. So mindfulness for me is a way to check into spaces while also being able to close, as I joke with our students and community, close the mental tabs, all the many windows we have floating around. For folks that uh, might be survivors or navigators of intimate partner violence, domestic violence, and harm, I want to acknowledge that closing your eyes during these kinds of activities can be deeply triggering. Um, so please do so at your own level of comfort. I'm going to keep mine open, but if it feels comfortable and relaxing to do so, please feel free to. And we'll start with a collective breath in, breathing in, and out. Maybe one more time, breathing in and out. And to set the stage for this conversation, I want to invite folks to bring to the front of their mind, who do you call home? Maybe not where, but who do you call home? Who are those people, those memories? Breathing in and out. Next, bringing to the front of your mind, who are you accountable to in the work that you do? When all is said and done, who is to hold you account and to who are you accountable to? Breathing in and out. And as we're returning to the space, maybe opening eyes, eyes were closed, turning cameras on if they're on Zoom, <laughs> breathing it together, and out. Wanted to prioritize that over all of the many slides. So we'll start with that. As I shared, we're a multi-state, multi-jurisdiction um, social justice legal innovation lab. And my job there, like I said, is to lead what we term the community law school, um, but what in practice is uh, three different uh, forms of community-based justice work happening across Arizona and Utah. Um, so I specifically also lead the domestic violence legal advocates in Arizona, which are DV and family law focused justice workers um, who are working in Arizona in limited areas of law. I know I don't need to tell this room about justice work, and I know our friends right after me will be talking about justice work, so I'm not gonna any more than that. Um, but that's how I come to this conversation. That's how my co-author, that's not me, shocker, uh, and I come to this conversation um, in thinking about power and accountability. Um, so a lot of the work that we do um, as uh, my co-author, Kaylee Balser, being our lead for service innovation at the University of Arizona and University of Utah, um, when work enters our community law lab, she works with and in service of community to redesign what justice could look like. Once community and decision makers have come together to authorize that, it bounces over to me to make it happen. <laughs> so then we become the community law school. Um, so in a very nuts and bolts kind of way, that's how this work happens. Um, and we come to this conversation um, in a couple different ways. Um, so building community legal power um, and centering the importance of legal history and reimagining justice making processes. 
Um, we write, think, speak, and act a lot about the systematic pattern of disempowerment across legal systems. Um, so my co-author, uh, Professor Kaylee Balser, is a national certified counselor and also a, a law professor like myself. Um, and so because I lead our DV training, because her training is in repair and care, something we're thinking a lot about is the ways that uh, the unauthorized practice of law in this country mirrors and is in fact the exact same form of disempowerment um, that we see in forms of intimate partner and domestic violence, right? That it is one massive colonial structure, whether we're talking about power from a system or power from people, they're repeating patterns of power. Um, and so a little bit more of the why. Uh, so I, like uh, Black and Native movement leaders, have insisted for time immemorial, believe in linked fate. Um, so it was very important for me to be in this conversation and to be in Alaska as someone not from Alaska because I know what happens in Alaska is linked to what happens everywhere and vice versa. What happens in everywhere else affects all of us, as we heard very powerfully earlier, right? Um, so both of us are committed to repair. Um, and so something that we center in the piece um, is traditional ways by which U.S. legal education and our services are not and will never be enough. Um, so as Nicole reminded us earlier, right at the outset, um, that we have to dream. So our piece is a broader invite for U.S. settler law to rethink how justice happens and where justice happens. I've already covered this a lot on purpose so that I could skim very quickly, which is that we know that 82.7% of the U.S. and folks in the U.S. have experienced at least one traumatic event in their life. Uh, we know that uh, the trauma-informed principles of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, kind of give us a framework, right, for understanding how we might support folks through traumatic life events or through uh, traumatic instances in life. But we know that the legal profession, unlike many uh, nonprofit and or social sectors, has not, it has not caught on as quickly as maybe we would want or hope. Um, and then we know that cultural consciousness um, is merely one way of talking about honoring harm, right? Honoring harm, honoring power, and honoring uh, the systems and stories that bring us here. Um, so when we say culturally conscious, culturally responsive, all of these different lenses, what we're talking about is history. What we're talking about is trauma. We're talking about systems. We're talking about identity um, and the things that do give us power. Well, as uh, my co-author was kind of talking through all of these things, to me it was very clear, well, that's actually the same conversation, right, that we're having about community accountability. Um, that we're, we're looking for home, right, in justice making. That's the project. Um, we know that from the UN Commission on Legal Empowerment of the Poor, over, this was as of 2008, I want to say was that last report, uh, four, over 4 billion people are locked out of justice-making systems. In the U.S. in particular, that means a monopolization of legal power, which um, Nicole prefaced, y'all will talk, I'm sure, a lot more about <laughs> in the panel right after this. Um, and so we're really focusing on place-based advocacy as a form of critical legal empowerment. Now, tangibly, what could that look like, right? So... Uh, we want to honor the work of Megan Rides at the Door and Ashley, Trout, Ashley Troutman um, in their kind of discussion of what, what are different domains, right, in which we might kind of decolonize or rethink how we provide forms of service and care. Um, and so for us, this manifests as governance and leadership, policy, physical environment, engagement and involvement, cross-sector collaboration, screening, assessment and services, training and workforce development, progress monitoring and quality assurance, financing and evaluation, um, in terms of legal services, right? So kind of extending this framework about uh, the delivery of social services to say, this is the same problem we're grappling with, right? Um, in building out and supporting community-based justice worker initiatives in Arizona and Utah, these are the same questions that we're grappling with, whether it's traditional <laughs> legal aid or whether it is you know, new and innovative forms of legal help provision. So what I'm going to do for the sake of time is I'm just going to kind of give high level for each of these domains. Um, so in thinking about governance and leadership, what work are you doing to honor tri tribal self-determination and unique governmental structures when advancing uh, new innovative forms of legal help? How are you building relationships with community system actors? And who do people already trust when they are going for help? PowerPoint's more excited than I am, apparently. Policy. How are you ensuring that your policies align with trauma-informed principles um, and the use of tr traditional practices of healing and justice-making, right? That can be very easy to assume that lawyers will always have the answer when we know that's not true. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, especially in this room. 
Uh, but decentering what, what it means to have a legal mind in justice making. Uh, how might we resituate legal educator, educators everywhere as healers of past legal harms, right? That I think has continued to be a gap is that when we talk about innovation, when we talk about the future of justice making, the teachers and the actual lessons are often removed from that conversation, right? Um, and how are we atoning for and addressing the disempowerment that's facilitated by the unauthorized practice of law restrictions across this country? In terms of physical environment, how are you ensuring the physical space of your advocacy prioritizes choice and autonomy and the physical layout of justice making? Um, how are we decentering both settler legal practices and the profession's norms for how legal work should look, right? That there's no one size fits all model. Are we in, unintentionally treating community engagement as a checkbox, right? Um, are we treating community decision making as the norm, not the exception in the work that we do? Are we centering the dual place and power of communities' relations to one another, to land, and to self? Are we prioritizing a continuum of care, warm handoffs, um, and insisting on the indispensability of those who we serve? We'll unpack that one in the, when we get to questions, I promise. Are we using person-first language? Do our intake and data collection practices have clear and actionable purposes, right? instead of assuming why we're doing what we're doing. Alrighty, folks, we are chugging along to our staff trainings, provide a continuous and ongoing understanding of the intergenerational and historical traumas navigated by the folks that we serve. Are we employing intentional hiring practices and trust building to ensure that the folks who need help can receive help from someone that looks like them? Are we employing a feedback loop to ensure that progress is being shared, that community feedback is being implemented? And are we invol involving community in identifying what data collection should look like so it's not extractive? And are we advocating for the flexible use of funding so that there's never a stopgap in our services? Um, that our structures don't create a culture of crisis by way of innovation. And last, but certainly not least, are we mindful of the ways that data has historically been used against Black, Indigenous, and people of color? I sped through that. That was definitely way too long, but want this to be mostly the conversation. So thank you all. Thanks, Antonio. So we have a number of questions that I'm going to be pinging back off and forth uh, with Antonio and Christine um, um, to get Antonio's perspective on the article that he drafted and also to get Christine's perspective on how it's put into practice here in Alaska. So I'm going to start. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to interrupt us. I think we built in enough time at the end for one question. No, I'm kidding. Maybe two questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the first question, so talking about power, um, Antonio and Christine, how do you conceptualize power in your respective work? And what does it mean for you to be power conscious? I'm going to start with Christine, because she's right here. Um, I love power. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see if everybody was awake. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, it's a very... Uh, relevant question for if you work in the domestic violence field. Um, uh, and I think as I as I thought about this question, it is um, both implicated in our goal as advocates working with domestic and sexual violence survivors and in our methods and means of how we get there. Um, so uh, if uh, domestic and sexual violence is all about uh, power and control, coercive control, losing, um, power over your your humanity and your personhood because somebody else has controlled your finances or your um, children or your uh, where you can go, um, then our roles as advocates is always about re-empowering. And we're not doing our job if we are not re-empowering the individual. Um, so our direct service work has always been about doing that and hopefully doing it in a trauma-informed way, which we'll talk more about. Although I feel like those 10 domains I want like on my wall, just because we all get so busy and it's nice to revisit that. 
Um, uh, so, so that's one way that power is very central to um, what we do on a very individual basis, right? Um, uh, it's a it, domestic and sexual violence is a very private thing, and so re-empowering individuals is the heart of what we do, what we train our advocates to do. Um, it's an empower-based model. That's what community-based advocates are taught to do, um, to empower the individual. Um, we love training our advocates. Katie Soden, who's my colleague who's here, will, we always say like our favorite thing to do is to train advocates because we love sharing that knowledge and it's, it's really empowering for us. Um, on the other hand, as a direct services um, model in a world of limited resources, um, we wield a lot of power that we're really uncomfortable with. We do we do case review every week and we have to decide, I mean, I hate to say it, but it feels sometimes like who lives and who, who dies, who gets an attorney and who doesn't, who is going to have an attorney able to go with them into court to decide custody of their children, often the most critical thing in their life. Um, and so that is a very uncomfortable wielding of power that because we get a lot of money from the federal government or the state, we we must make those choices. Um, and I'm not ever comfortable with that power, um, which is why we are always looking for other ways to um, find ways to serve people. Um, so a couple answers there. Thank you. Um, thank y'all for bearing with me and flying through those slides. Now that those are done, I can say all the fun and explosive things. Um, I think, yeah, I really, I really appreciate that framing. And I really like, uh, where you took us there. Cause I think something that I try to shout as loud as I can in any space that I enter, um, is that we don't have legal deserts in this country in the way that we might think of. Right. So when we think of the unauthorized practice of law restrictions and the history of them and the way that they've moved from, uh, and it's state by state, but in moving from generally legislatures to now state Supreme Courts and like this self-regulated practice of law, there's something to be said of us using the metaphor of deserts, right? That we assume they're naturally occurring when we know that's not the case. They're imposed by colonial structures. They're imposed by settler law. They're imposed by the legal profession that there's not a desert that artificially exists or that, you know, that naturally exists. It was artificially created, right? So when we think about power, especially this conversation of choosing, triaging, who gets legal power, who lives and who dies, that's a self-settler made crisis, right? That there, there was not a pre-existing necessarily uh, decision-making process of like, this person is deserving or worthy of help, or this person is deserving or worthy of using legal systems. Um, that's a, a, a newer phenomenon. So that's something that I'm thinking a lot about today, especially in the context of the domains. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Antonio and Christine. Um, so one of the things that I, I wanted to uplift from Antonio's article is, is really what you say in your conclusion, Antonio, and I'm gonna kind of start with you here. Um, in the work that we do alongside Alaska Native tribes, um, you know, somebody this morning said that our communities are not monolithic, right? Um, and so we always take a step back and we learn the values of the community. We learn what the tribe is looking for. We speak with council and we speak with community members so that we're drafting and doing the work that really is reflective of that community. Um, I know when we're working with victim survivors that oftentimes our first priority is to find the needs of the survivors, find them safety, find them protection. But up and above that, it is incorporating the values of that community, that tribe, thinking about what is gonna work for them um, that may be different from their neighboring tribe. Um, and so when I was reading through the article, the, the question of who am I accountable? Um, of course, you know, there's different layers of accountability. Again, victim survivor first, tribe and community second, how it integrates with the state system is probably third. Um, but Antonio, based on your work, what do you see as the connections between being trauma-informed and community accountable work. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the power to disrupt, right? That it, we're all kind of inheritors. As some, as and anyone wanting to engage in settler legal systems, we are inheritors either to 
lineages of violence or lineages of opportunity, right? That it is either the opportunity to disrupt what has been and continues to be a history of violence um, or one to atone, to facilitate re repair, truth and reconciliation, right? So I see those as kind of the same, right? That when we talk about being trauma-informed or when we talk about being community accountable, both of those are honoring self, both of them are honoring other, and they're honoring place and space. So um, in terms of place-based advocacy, um, being trauma-informed requires that we're accountable to community, right? Because we have to know what the dynamics of the community are when we're supporting someone in order to know, hey, if I make this warm handoff a referral, am I referring them to someone who is best friends with their abuser? Am I referring to them, uh, you know, someone or a service that I know will actually be detrimental to them? even though my intake form doesn't say otherwise, right? Um, so understanding the different networks and forms of power, even within the community and, and ecosystem, requires that we are both trauma-informed and accountable. Um, yeah, I looked at it a little, this question a little bit differently, but I think we got to the same place. Um, uh, when I thought about this, I thought about the heart of what we do um, with survivors is create options, right? Like we give people options. And I looked at it on a very individual basis in a way, so self. Um, and um, I actually went back to my days as a baby lawyer at Alaska Legal Services where we were um, arguing for... Um, uh, acknowledgement of tribal court adoptions and tribal court custody orders. Um, and we argued that public law 280, 280 merely opened up the courthouse doors for, for people, which I thought this is brilliant for survivors. We want options for people. We want them to be able to go to tribal court if that is what is safest for them and best for them and most accessible for them and most trauma informed for them. Um, but we also want there to be a state court option if maybe their abuser is on tribal council. Um, uh, and so um, I think that um, it, something that is um, trauma informed um, is generally communally, community accountable, but maybe not always <laughs> in my mind. Um, uh, even though I think that in terms of our Alaska Native community and survivors in Alaska Native having better, safer options in our rural communities is, is critically important. Thank you, Christine. Um, next question, I'm actually going to start with you. Um, for those that are not familiar with Alaska that are visiting, maybe um, approximately 80% of our Alaska communities are considered to be rural, um, mainly off-road system, um, with the exception of Fairbanks, um, Anchorage, of course, Juneau. Um, most of our communities are off-road system and considered rural. Um, so Christine, in your opinion, why is place-based advocacy important, especially when working in service of our rural communities? Um, well, I mean, I guess it's, so first of all, I live in Sitka. I've lived in Sitka for 30, for over 30 years. Um, and so I, um, have lived in a smaller community. Um, I, I think that for survivors as someone who's lived in rural Alaska for many, many years, um, there is just the access issue, number one, right? Um, it's going to be for a survivor in, uh, Cloak or in uh, Huslia, um, getting to the state courthouse is very difficult. And so um, uh, safety and well-being is critical to having something that is very close to you and easily accessible. Um, uh, cultural understanding, um, uh, state court options are not um, always trauma-informed. Surprise. <laughs> I know I know the state court system is working better at that, but um, state court is scary. It's scary for attorneys. <laughs> Imagine what it is like for survivors going into state court. Um, so um, often um, tribal court options or local options are um, much safer and much more um, uh, friendly to survivors. Not not always though, because sometimes tribal courts don't have safety. Um, I, I've been in a tribal court where we were in the conference room and perhaps there were, weren't the safety um, safeguards that one needed um, to do a protective order. Whereas if you go to the state court, um, not in Sitka, but in most places there's a metal detector, which may be important. Again, it's not a cookie cutter thing. 
options. You need to give people options. And the trauma-informed approach is always, what is safest to you? What does safety mean to you and your family? Um, where, what are you most concerned about? Um, uh, understanding that and hearing that um, is what is going to be best for survivors. And Antonio. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was like, I, I, I give this. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, so I'll start by sharing uh, part of the rationale for the grounding exercise. So every person that I call home is from one small desert town in Southern Arizona. I don't have kin or family anywhere else. They're all in one place. So I think a lot of, and they're in a very rural small town where the number one employer is the private prisons and the number two is McDonald's. So I have a lot of thoughts about rural advocacy, um, but I'll start by saying, I think it's particularly important that we are place-based because I recognize that what's gonna work in that town is never gonna work in any other place and vice versa from any place here in Alaska, anywhere else in that way, right? In very specific place-based advocacy. Um, and so I really appreciated everything you were saying about, like, it is all about choice. It is all about self-determination and autonomy at, at the end of the day. Um, that in order to do this work right and in order to best be in service of rural communities, we have to recognize that it can't be churning out legal labor, like flying in lawyers to, or you, I mean, they, flying, I mean that metaphorically, but also literally, right? Um, that only the folks that have lived and learned understandings of space and place are going to know what, how, to, how to have a conversation and how to support folks through legal advocacy. Um, so this idea, right, the, the normative or the big picture idea um, that lawyers are gonna save the day all the time and all of the best trained lawyers are just gonna pop into any place and automatically fix all the problems, I think is really dangerous, right? And I think it, it sets us up for a, a not just a disservice, but also a fundamental misunderstanding of what the needs of survivors and also of rural communities are, which is not a savior or a hero or any of the ways that our many law schools and formal legal training come to uh, prepare folks for entering this work, right? Um, so that's a whole separate rabbit hole that I could go down. But uh, in terms of place-based advocacy specifically, I think that, like, put this in language already on the slides, but refusing and insisting on not having a checklist, that like it has to be a specific way every single time, um, or not recognizing that it's going to look different for every single person we support, for every survivor that we're helping navigate a process or a system, um, that it can't, it can't be one rigid structure ever. When you were talking about that, it brought me back again to my days as a baby lawyer at Alaska Legal Services. I was in the Fairbanks office, and um, back then they used to fly us out to our rural communities. Um, and I was, um, you know, you'd go, you'd sleep on the floor in the school, and you do intake for a day. And um, I always felt like I, I don't think we're doing this right. It's like who, who like I'm like the it seems like I'm the child support work, you know, they don't know me like a helper from the, the person who is like coming in to enforce child support, right? It did not, not feel good. I think we've, Alaska Legal Services has come a long way, <laughs> but that, that resonated with me. You can't just fly an attorney in. Yeah, lawyers don't have the answers all the time, right? As much as we think that we want to. Um, I, I want to share a story recently. I was helping a tribe. They were doing a child protection case. Um, and in this particular tribal court, attorneys are not allowed to speak, right? The tribal judges want to hear directly from the participants, directly from their citizens. Um, attorneys are allowed to attend. However, if the judge asks them a question, they can speak. Um, so prior, I, I had sent the laws. I sent the procedures to this particular attorney. Um, and, you know, I assumed they were going to read through it. Well, lo and behold, that attorney came into court on telephone and started speaking right away, um, just barreling through the judges and speaking. Um, we legitimately had to throw the attorney out. Um, and so I assumed that they had read the rules of procedure. They had read the laws of the tribe, but they didn't. They felt like they had this entitlement right to come in and speak whatever they wanted to speak. So um, we don't always have the answers. I'm talking about place-based advocacy and making sure that you're understanding the community that you're being involved with, especially on the justice side, is so super important. 
Okay, so the last question I have before we answer, open it up to questions, um, and, a, and a really interesting one, but um, I'm gonna start with Christine. I'm gonna start with Antonio. <laughs> Um, and the question is, how have you seen power serve as both a tool and a barrier to advancing rural legal advocacy? I'll do this in two parts so that we can go back and forth. We can volley, we can volley. Um, yeah, I mean, I think especially, again, I won't dive too, too deep into the justice work combo. I want to save that for the next panel. But um, I will say when we start having conversations about who is deserving and worthy of legal power in this country, and like under what models, under what constraint, and under what criteria, right? It, we start to tug at the, the deeper threads, right? So when we're talking about legal paraprofessionals, when we're talking about community-based justice workers, when we're talking about court navigators, um, the broader sure. ecosystem of folks that are helping, it forces us to reckon with a deeper question of who is allowed and who is deserving of help, right? And so when we start entrenching this common question of like, oh, well, it's gonna be a character and fitness process all over again. And oh, it's gonna be these things. And oh, it's gonna, they have to be a US citizen or legal resident. We're recreating the same harms that we already experienced with the legal profession, right? We're, all, we're just repeating the same who is deserving. And so I think it does a disservice overwhelmingly to rural legal advocacy and to uh, multiply marginalized communities, to folks who are navigating harm, for us to continue to have this argument and conversation of who is deserving and who is worthy enough? Because it is all, it will always lead us to a race to the bottom. I agree with that because I mean, I, I am not comfortable with that conversation as I've said. And for a long time, it, it um, uh, we, the legal services community here um, really pushed for a right to counsel in civil cases, especially when there was what we, what we considered a fundamental right, custody, housing. Um, and um, we hit some walls on that, <laughs> which is, I think, <laughs> Nicole's smiling, um, perhaps how uh, part of, of how the, the road opened for community justice workers. So um, I, I think we, we realize there's never going to be enough money or lawyers in the world, nor do we want them necessarily for all the things that have been articulated today um, to... Um, you know, to have lawyers for everybody. So um, anyway, I um, I think that, uh, what was the question again? What am I answering? <laughs> uh, your, why is place-based advocacy important when working? Oh, I'm sorry, no. Um, have you seen power serve as both a tool and a barrier to addressing rural legal advocacy? I could really come up with a lot of barriers. Um, the tools were harder on this one. So uh, obviously, I mean, dominant culture, um, regionalization, like urbanization, all those you're fighting against when you're trying to create more power in rural-based advocacy. Um, uh, resources, how are we going to create a justice system in 229 villages and tribal entities? Um, those are the um, barriers that that will be put up um, in in trying to create more rural rural based advocacy. Um, I'd like to hear about tools if you have any that you'd like to bring up because that that was the part of the question I really struggled with. Yeah, so something that we are very intentional about at Innovation for Justice in the so we run four different right now cohorts of justice worker, community-based justice worker trainings in Arizona and Utah. Um, and regardless of whether they're going into DV advocacy, family law, medical debt, housing stability, um, because of the unauthorized practice of law reform that has happened in both states and because of the infrastructure we've built out to train and support folks, every single justice worker starts with a trauma-informed advocacy module, which we know for many is already lived, learned, and embodied in some way, shape, or form because of maybe their own navigation of systems or forms of harm, um, but providing a common language to say, this is what you might have experienced, right? Or this is something to name what you might be feeling. Um, in thinking about rural legal advocacy especially, I think uh, a lot of the work that we do, I mean, all of the work that we do is virtual and, comma, and, all of the support systems we provide are both synchronous and virtual and in-person um, so that we can meet folks where they are and also connect folks across the state. Um, so we have regular meetups 
uh, for all of our uh, current and active justice workers in Arizona and Utah um, so that they can connect with one another, share resources, but I'm going down a rabbit hole here, other than to say, I do think that when we talk about power and especially reform of law generally, there is always and will continue to be an opportunity to build power based on a system that was predicated on disempowering, right? So there's always gonna be this huge gap. There's always going to be space for us to build power, but that's exciting. Right? That's invigorating for us to say, okay, this is, this is a movement to build power. This is an opportunity for us to fill what has been not just a vacuum, right, but a systemic erasure of power. So, Yeah, that, that is helpful um, because I, I'm thinking of our community-based advocates who have gone to court for many years, whether it's uh, tribal or um, mostly state court, and not been able to speak. They can sit there with a survivor and write notes to them, um, but they can't actually speak in court. Um, and so it is very empowering to them at the thought that they might be able as a community justice worker to speak. I should say most of them, because I think some of them will be a little terrified by it actually. <laughs> but I think also the idea of um, community-based advocates, um, there is power in taking hold of your community and your justice issues that many will, will find. I have one last thing. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, that was actually, you're reminding me of a story that we'll, we'll, I will share with the world and people soon, I promise, but a story from one of our justice workers in Arizona um, who talks a lot about how going to law school and becoming a formally trained lawyer was never an option for her and how healing it was to become a community-based justice worker because of the structural barriers to going to the law. And so she lays it out in this very beautiful um, testimony of self, but it, it was a reminder, right? That like, this isn't just in theory, it's not just in like in words or uh, in, in academic speak, but this is actually healing for us to replace where justice is happening. So food for thought as we continue dreaming and reforming folks. Well, everyone, I think I lied. I don't think we have time for a question, but I know that Antonio, Christine, and myself are going to be here throughout the rest of the day. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. But let's please give Antonio and Christine a round of applause for the contribution. Thank you. Can we get our our last group of panelists up to the front, please? Glad you made it. For helping me make my way. A bit warm. <laughs> so did you ever take any classes with Lisa Hansley? I do. I I do. I do. I I do. I Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I never took a class with him. Did you study in No. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our last panel of the day. Everyone can get integrated again. <laughs> and thank you so much to that last panel. That was wonderful. Um, our final panel today is titled Norse to the Future, Access to Justice in the Future of Justice Work. This panel is moderated by Pearl Pickett. Pearl is the Native Law Supervising Attorney with Alaska Legal Services Corporation. She has practiced law with a focus on representing tribal clients in child welfare proceedings since 2013 and is a member of the Alaska Bar Association. Hi, um, we're joined here today um, by 
but I'm hoping will actually be a legitimate discussion with pe questions from people other than me um, by um, Rebecca Sandifer. Um, she is the director of the Sanford School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University, um, where her research centers on access to justice approach from a myriad of angles. Um, she is a faculty fellow um, at the American Bar Foundation, um, where she founded and leads the Access to Justice Research Initiative. Um, in 2018, she was named a MacArthur Fellow for her work in, on inequality and access to justice, and she is co-founder, along with Matthew Burnett, for, of Frontline Justice. Um, Matthew is the senior, senior program officer for Access to Justice Research Initiative at the American Bar Foundation, visiting scholar for Justice Futures at Arizona State University, adjunct law professor at Georgetown University Law Center, um, and previously served as senior policy officer um, at Open Society Foundations, um, focusing on, on access to justice on an international level, um, as well as um, domestically. Um, he is co-founder um, and previously led the Immigration Advocates Network and served as a law clerk to Justice um, Yacoub of the Constitutional Court of South, South Africa. Um, he currently serves, serves as an advisor to the National Center for Access to Justice and is co-founder, again, <laughs> um, with, um, with Ms. Sandifer of, um, the, of Frontline Justice. Um, Mara Kimmel is executive director of the ACLU as of um, 2022, um, but has served in a variety of capacities advocating for justice, responding to various community needs um, arising within Alaska, um, addressing subsistence issues, immigration issues, um, serving as a regional on the regional advisory board for the Anti-Defamation League, um, serving on the national board of directors for Welcoming America, um, and is has a PhD from Central European University, a JD from Minnesota University of Minnesota Law School, um, and a master's degree from UAF, and a bachelor's degree from University of California, Berkeley. And finally, we have Joy Anderson, who is co-director of the Community Justice Worker Resource Center, um, a, initiative within the within Alaska Legal Services Corporation. She was previously general counsel at the Association of Village Council Presidents, which is a regional nonprofit um, serving 56 tr federally recognized tribes in Western Alaska. Um, she has experience representing and supporting tribes and tribal organizations um, in the areas of corporate governance, Indian child welfare, and rural public safety. Um, she is a graduate of Oakwood University and Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt University Law School. Um, and while originally from Alabama, um, she's lived in Bethel for the past 10 years. Um, and to start us off, um, we're going to hear from Joy for information and updates on how Alaska's community justice worker is program is being implemented. Thanks, Pearl. And thanks, Allison, and all the editors and members of the Alaska Law Review staff. Thank you for the invitation to come on the panel and also for the invitation to write the article for the upcoming issue, Community Justice Workers, Part of the Solution to Alaska's Legal Deserts, artificially created, as Antonio just reminded us. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my co-author, Sarah Carver, uh, co-director for the Community Justice Worker Resource Center, and also Dr. Robert Anders, the medical director for Manila Lake Health Center. The Spring 2024 Todd Communications Directory, if you have it and like to read it, or if you're just familiar with these communities, we'll let you know that there are four private attorneys and one civil legal aid attorney in Bethel, which is the hub community that serves a region of 27,000. And in Nome, there are two private attorneys and one civil legal aid attorney at the time the directory came out serving a region of 10,000. So these and many other areas in Alaska qualify as the artificially designated legal deserts where there are few or no attorneys available to serve residents. And residents either have to travel or we're lucky in Alaska that everything can happen over the phone with our court system. But even with that, some people just really want to look the person helping them in the eye and they're un unable to do that when they can only, you know, Google and speak to someone that they'll never meet. 
So we do have the issue of these artificial legal deserts. That's one thing. But even when attorneys can be found, many people can't afford the cost of them. And so 50 million Americans are below 125% of the poverty level, which is what Legal Services Corporation draws the line for its funded legal aid organizations to be able to provide legal assistance. So for the people that are eligible for LSC funded legal help, unfortunately, those organizations, as Nicole mentioned this morning, are having to turn away at least one client or decline one legal issue for every issue that they can take on due to lack of resources, whether that be lack of attorneys or lack of funding. So access to justice has many definitions and it's used by many different organizations, but you can boil it down to being able to get help with your legal needs. And if you need assistance, you can both find that assistance and you can afford it. So that's where the access to justice gap comes in. There's a big chasm between the people who need help and the people that can access it. So as mentioned earlier, Alaska um, Alaska is really a leader, actually, in trying to address the access to justice issue. And in fact, I've tried to help some friends. I won't name in what states they were living, but I've gone online to just expecting that the court self-help forms will be as easily accessible as Alaska. And let me just tell you, they are not. And I won't tell you how many hours I spent trying to figure out how you could get a minor guardianship from some other states. But in 20, the end of 2016 and 2017, Alaska participated in a Justice for All um, grant, and as part of that, they participated in the asset mapping that Nicole mentioned, and I think Mara participated in, as well as many other organizations, and that was looking at uh, what's most available in communities among legal services, social service organizations, medical professions, and also information services, information systems. And what was found is that the largest footprint is definitely healthcare, which may not be a big surprise. And the largest footprint in rural Alaska by and far was the tribal healthcare system, which Alex had mentioned in the first panel is one of the great examples of self-determination <clears throat> in Alaska for Alaska tribes. One of the reasons the Alaska healthcare system is so successful is because instead of importing an MD or an NP or a PA into every single uh, rural community, instead they looked at who's already in the community, who's interested in helping and provided a pathway for education and training for individuals to provide health care, a certain scope of health care in their own communities. And so everyone from Alaska is probably familiar with the Community Health Aid Practitioner or the CHAP program and also DHATs and BHAs. So out of that uh, Justice for All project, one thing that came out is we really need to look at tribal health care. They're really doing it right if your definition of doing it right is letting people access help where they live. And so inspired by that, Alaska Legal Services uh, developed what, you know, we're calling or you've heard Nicole calling the Alaska model for community justice workers. As, as you've heard, there's many people providing justice work in their different communities. But since the program in Alaska was inspired by the healthcare uh, model, that's why we, that's why we're calling it the Alaska uh, model. And it's the idea of finding an individual in a community and then providing high quality targeted education and training to that person. So partnering with the ANTHC, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium's Distance Learning Network, which are experts in providing adult education, uh, especially to rural Alaskans, we developed in 2018 after the Justice for All project, um, developed five courses to start out in SNAP advocacy, wills, domestic violence advocacy, ICWA, and um, consumer debt protection. 
the idea for starting in these courses came from what communities were saying the biggest needs were. So the biggest needs for education, um, for direct assistance, uh, for supporting people that were already doing this work but maybe wanted more knowledge were in these five areas. And so with ANTHC, courses were, divide, were developed that included um, inspiration and advice from Alaska Native elders, um, included interactive components, were short, so the courses can be completed in 10 hours or less, do require internet, but work with low bandwidth and are asynchronous. So these courses were developed, deployed, tested by different um, partners. Uh, we worked with AVCP and Canna as well as others. And also we worked with Alaska Pacific University. They're also experts in delivering adult education um, in rural Alaska. And so these courses are hosted on APU's Blackboard Education website. So this was a way that community justice workers were able to take the courses and then be able to provide assistance to individuals, whether that was writing a will or um, participating in SNAP advocacy. For example, if someone was having a SNAP benefit delay or denial issue, which brings me to talking about SNAP, which everyone has heard a lot about in the last um, few years. So in fall of 2022, that was, I believe, the start of kind of the big SNAP blow up for a technical term that um, we experienced here in Alaska. And Alaska Legal Services um, cases, intakes, clients calling for help with a SNAP delay or denial issue increased 2,000% in 2023. Um, we went from 125 cases of that type in 2022 to over 3,000 in 2023. So it was a huge um, a huge lift for ALSC, and like you heard earlier, you know, legal aid organizations often have to turn away one person for every one person we can help, and that just wasn't an option when the SNAP cases were coming in to turn people away for lack of resources. So staff attorneys took on a lot of cases. We really leaned on our pro bono volunteers, and the legal community responded, and Attorneys were taking, you know, tons of SNAP cases, pro bono attorneys, but we also were lucky because we could turn to a different set of volunteers as well, and those were community justice workers. So luckily, the SNAP uh, course had already been created. There were already about 60 CJWs trained to submit fair hearing requests um, and follow up for clients, and just by word of mouth, when people in the community, when people in the healthcare systems, people at tribal orgs, law students, when they heard that there was something they could do to help address the SNAP crisis, the number of volunteers grew. I, we weren't doing a lot of active recruiting. They, I wasn't there at the time. I was a, I was a pro bono attorney taking uh, cases, but there wasn't a lot of recruiting done. It was word of mouth more people heard there's something we can do to help and they signed up, they took the CJW um, SNAP course and then they signed up to take cases for clients. And so that just shows, which I think our panelists, other panelists will speak about, it, it's easy to scale when the, when the barriers are low to entry. So the course was already prepared, it was free, individuals were able to take it you know, on their own time. And so they could volunteer to be able to help their community members. Um, they were wildly successful. Um, CJW, this is not all ALSC volunteers, just CJW volunteers alone recover $1.43 million in benefits. Uh, they closed over 500 SNAP cases with 100% success rate. And that included, you know, filing the fair hearing requests, following up and negotiating with uh, state employees, in a few cases, representing clients in fair hearing requests, 
letting ALSC staff know about issues that they were seeing so then our advocacy director and their team could address it with DPA and providing a lot of communication, I mean, community education and outreach. So the community justice workers, it continues to be a growing movement within ALSC. Um, SNAP is the most visible uh, what thing we've been able to point to so far, but it's not the only uh, thing happening with community justice workers at Alaska Legal Services. One of the things that we are really focusing on now, which um, has been brought up by multiple panels, is really wanting to dig deep into all of the communities, especially with the social, social service organizations that are already there, and develop partnerships so that we can um, amplify the work that each other uh, is doing. Uh, one of those examples is with ABCP, which um, is an organization where I live, a tribal consortium, that their realty department has identified a problem in that community as specific to fractionization of native allotments. And one of the ways they've identified to address that is helping individuals to write wills. Um, a potential barrier to will writing is the fact that, you know, in a region of 27,000, there's only of four attorneys and only one of them providing free civil legal aid. But the way around that is ABCP's realty staff have all become community justice workers. They've all taken the will writing course and they're all able now to write wills for clients instead of refer their clients to a legal aid organization or, or a private attorney who may or may not be able to take their case. Um, to everyone they would have previously had to refer out, they can just help instead. Uh, and recently in Bethel and Tuxic, we were able to partner with the ABCP CJWs in doing a will writing clinic. So that's one example that we hope to expand. Um, organizations that work with people who have survived domestic violence or sexual assault, we're hoping to partner with them as well. We have emails. I don't know. Where Christine and mm -hmm. sure where there Christine and Katie are you know emails going back and forth where we hope to be able to um, uh, partner with each other to okay. expand in those type of organizations and others as well. We're also working. Pearl said, "Hurry up." We're also working with four um, Indian legal services organizations in the lower 48: Montana, Oklahoma, Arizona, and Montana um, on a on a joint grant to hire community justice workers in regions that have been impacted by disasters. So in Alaska, we have hired full-time CJWs in uh, five locations, I believe, in Bethel, Fairbanks, Nome, uh, Kenai, and uh, Palmer, and Rylan Obeso is our CJW in Palmer, uh, born and raised in Alaska. So that is another um, way the program is expanding. Also, the head of our public defender agency is here, who's also from Bethel. And we're very um, proud of our holistic defense partnership mm -hmm. with the public defender agency. And one of the positions previously um, filled by an attorney, sometimes hard to staff, is currently filled by a CJW in the Bethel office, working very well with the um, Bethel PD office and our holistic defense project there. And then lastly, I just quickly want to mention, which Nicole mentioned earlier, the Alaska Bar Rule 43.5 waiver to engage in the limited practice of law, which was passed in November uh, 2022. Uh, that's one of, the main, um, one of the main goals of the Community Justice Worker Resource Center right now is to determine the best way to uh, train and support CJWs to be able to um, practice and represent clients in court. And again, we'd like to engage with and work with partners in doing that as well. Okay, I have to give the mic over, but you can read the article when it comes out. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joy. Um, and now um, I'd like either Matthew or Rebecca to, I guess, inform us about how Alaska's model fits within the larger sort of 
non-attorney legal advocacy landscape and what's going on elsewhere in the country. Okay, great. We'll be quick because we do want to get to questions. Um, the, I mean, so there are two kind of things happening on the regulatory reform landscape um, nationally. One is around alternative business structures, is basically who can own uh, law firms, and the other is around UPL reform. That the access to justice action is all under the kind of UPL banner, um, and <clears throat> there are a number of different programs um, that are experimenting with different models of doing this. Um, one is uh, in Utah. There's a sandbox, which most folks might have heard of, or some folks might have heard of. Uh, and the regulatory sandbox basically allows entrants to apply um, and then be supervised um, based on their risk, um, which uh, is really proxy for um, sort of um, how adjacent they are to attorneys. So the more attorney involvement, less risk, less attorney involvement, more risk. Um, other models that have emerged in Delaware, there's a qualified tenant advocate program. Um, in uh, a few states, there are licensed per professional programs. Uh, in South Carolina, there's a Supreme Court carve out um, based on some litigation uh, that was brought there by the NAACP, um, which basically allows for one kind of um, tenant advocate program to emerge. Arizona, as Antonio said, uh, has both domestic violence and uh, housing stability advocates. And then there are these emerging justice worker models. So Alaska was the first out of the gate um, with a waiver, a UPL waiver from the Supreme Court with unanimous support from the state bar. One of the things we talk about in our article is the importance of political support um, by courts, the bar and, uh, and, and others. Um, and then there are a couple of states that are further ahead on similar kinds of waivers. So one of those is in Texas um, where there's a kind of hybrid proposal that's now out for comment. Uh, one of the op, one of the pieces of that is essentially a licensed paraprofessional program. The other is a, a justice worker program, and then Arizona is also um, in the in the process of proposing a rule around community justice workers. Um, so that's kind of the the national landscape. And I'll turn it over to Becky to add all the things that I've forgotten. He was right about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so. Alaska Legal Services says we. <laughs> I didn't know that it was that funny. Um, so Alaska Legal Services, wow. we've talked about um, as these scopes of work that that we have trained community justice workers both externally and internally on. Um, but we also have gotten into that 125 percent the federal poverty level. Um, what that means in Alaska as a household of one is twenty three thousand dollars five hundred. Well. $23,000. Um, so there's another justice gap, potentially. It's people who are eligible for our services. We are the only legal aid um, organization in, in the state. If we have a conflict of interest, you don't get our services. If you do not qualify for our services on an economic level, you do not get our services. Um, and so I know that Mara had flagged that there's a, a good potential for, for this to be expanded outside of just legal services grantees to fill in the needs of not just people who absolutely cannot afford an attorney, but people who practically can't afford an attorney as well. Um, because I don't know who has um, a couple thousand dollars making $23,000 a year to pay an attorney for a custody suit. But um, hopefully you can address sort of where you've seen that and especially drawing on your immigration experience where those non-attorney roles can be really valuable. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is this working? Okay. Um, I'd like to step back just for a second, if I could, though, to what's gone on over the past five to six years in our state since we first um, envisioned the original justice for all uh, work that we did at the court system. And I think one of the impetuses behind that work was to imagine a world in Alaska where all of us are able to determine our own fates and our own futures, and that we can ensure our own well-being and our health. And Dr. Anders, who was mentioned just a minute ago, was a key part of developing that vision. He used to talk, or he probably still does, talk about the legal determinants of health. And so really expanding this notion that, that 
law, our legal status, our legal state of being can have impacts well beyond just whether we're going to be sued or not, but they can have actual physical impacts on us as well. And Nicole touched on that this morning in her keynote, which was brilliant, by the way, um, talking about how sometimes people have legal problems that they don't even see or understand as legal problems. And so we started really to envision, again, a better world in our state. And fast forward to now and today, all of the discussion that we've had, starting with Nicole and up until this panel, describing all of the steps that we've taken in implementing that vision. And, we, you know, for example, Jeannie and JJ talked about tech access. That's new and that is absolutely critical in a state like ours, where sometimes the only way we can connect with each other is over a text because of the miles, because of the geography, because of the physical barriers. Um, and, you know, the development of trauma-informed lawyering and trauma-informed service delivery is starting to take root much, much deeper. And so as we're looking to the future, and I think this is getting to your point, there, I just wanted to raise um, one issue, one sort of caution, which I may be very much alone in this room, and my apologies to Antonio and to Matthew, because I do think that the unauthor unauthorized practice of law issue in Alaska is critical and something that actually does need to be considered. So I practiced immigration law for 10 years in our state, and I can't tell you how many clients came to me because of what are called notarios. So people who are out there assisting folks with their immigration papers and have no experience, no skills, no training, no guardrails. And so people get really hurt and people's immigration status and therefore their future is really impacted. And so my, my big question in all of this and my big caution, and I think that it can very easily be addressed um, actually through the community justice worker model is how are we going to make sure that we are protecting Alaskans uh, we don't have great consumer protection laws in our state either, so that's not really an option. And if you do find yourself scammed, then you're back right in the position of needing to find a lawyer, and we've heard all day about how lawyers are hard to find. So that, that's just one big sort of bright and shiny issue that we have been confronting over the years of doing this work in Alaska. But I think um, what, you know, to go back to my original point of imagining a world where we can all ensure our health and our well-being and a future and a fate that meets with our vision for ourselves and our families. This is really hopeful. Nicole mentioned hope a lot this morning, and I would have to agree this model that we've been able to implement, thanks to the leadership of Alaska Legal Services, offers an opportunity, I think, to really bring to fruition some of the vision that we had so long ago. There's an opportunity to scale. So in addition to, uh, to the income barriers that people who make over 125% of income face who can't access Alaska Legal Services, there are also federal restrictions in our state. So Alaska Legal Services can't help people get immigration documents. They can't help people who are in prison. And those happen to be two of the primary populations who I've worked with in, in my career. And so the ability to start to think about how this model could be deployed with these consumer protections, because again, I think if we can expand, for example, the community justice worker model in the immigration context to an organization called the Alaska Institute for Justice, who's the state's only nonprofit immigration service provider, uh, to, to ensure that immigrants can get access to services, um, to if we can expand the criminal justice, I'm sorry, the community justice worker model to the criminal justice arena or criminal legal structure, where we at the Alaska ACLU operate a prison project, and we can help to train people who are either inside in carceral, or carceral facilities, or families, or friends, or people who are concerned about the fact that. Alaska actually has one of the highest levels of incarceration in our state. One in every seven Alaskans is either in car has either been incarcerated or has a family or, or a friend who has been incarcerated. So the rates of incarceration here are profound. And half of the people right now who are incarcerated are unsentenced. They are, it's, it's um, pre-conviction. 
So it, it's pre-indictment in a lot of way, in a lot of times, situations. So there's a real serious need for legal help. And so this model, I think, more than any other model that we've been exploring in the state, has hope and has the potential, as long as we can scale it and apply it beyond Alaska Legal Services, who does incredible work and the SNAP example that you provided, that's such a success story. And just imagine what the state could look like, what the vision we could have to make sure that all of us as Alaskans are able to ensure a, a healthy and bright future for ourselves and our families. This is critical to that effort. So I really wanna thank Alaska Legal Services for really like shepherding this challenge. It has been an amazing thing to watch unfold. Um, and I also just belatedly wanna thank the uh, Alaska Law Review and the Duke Law students for all the work that they've done to put this on. <laughs> um, Joy, can you? Maybe not. Um, I think I'm loud enough. Does anyone else agree? I think great. Should I just not turn it it's on? Dead. It's dead. Oh, it's but it's okay. I'm loud. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm hoping. Joy, can you talk about um, how far ALSC has been able to go in making use of um, the Supreme Court sort of way for sort of expanding the the practice of law to include non-attorneys and whether or not um, any of the, whether volunteer or staff CJWs have been able to, to serve in that in-court advocacy role yet? Uh. Sure. Um, we're in the development phase of what the training process will look like. And I did want to respond to Mara's comment about, you know, the need to protect uh, the individuals that are getting legal services. That's very important. I think the Supreme Court did recognize that in the requirements under the waiver. So the individuals need to be trained and supervised by Alaska Legal Services. Um, the client needs to also give informed consent that they understand they're being represented by a community justice worker. And with those protections, I think that can be very easily, you know, extended to the other legal services providers in the state. So when, not if that question comes up again, um, we hope that we're able to support that from Alaska Legal Services by showing the success of CJWs that have practiced under the waiver. One last thing, and I'm hoping we'll, that other folks can answer. One thing that has, I guess, <laughs> excited and then worried me about, about this particular model is that it is cabined um, still to individuals who qualify for legal aid, um, that it requires supervision by um, legal aid. And, and whether or not there's ability to attract and retain um, non-attorney talent in this area and provide a, a means of a career path that would be independent. Um, noting that the limited licensed legal technicians of, of Washington State had an, the ability to practice independently, I understand, but Washington State has determined that they want to sundown that, 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 it's, that that program is no longer going to operate, that you, if you're in the door, fine, but we're, the door has closed. And so what vision do you have about uh, for how non-attorneys can grow their practices outside of these low-income legal aid practice models where, where the only people who can access non-attorney advocates are people who cannot afford attorneys? Do you have any insights on that? <laughs> well, so we live in the world um, and we have to work with what's possible and, and having legal aid supervise justice workers is possible right now. UPL restrictions in, in Alaska are fairly limited compared to other states. But, if, but in order to make possible what you're describing, what we have to do is get rid of UPL or scale it way back, right? So that, so that, it isn't, so that the activity of justice workers doesn't necessarily always have to be at least formally controlled by attorneys, which is the model that you're describing. There are other, though, justice worker initiatives around the country, some of them Antonio is part of, where there aren't supervising attorneys. Um, I think in, in Arizona, they're authorized by individual court order for each program, and then in Utah, in the regulatory sandbox, 
an entity doesn't have to have an attorney to field justice workers and have them do things. So there are, there are different ways to do that, but I do think it does require lawyers kind of getting out of the way, one way or another. Well, I would just add there's also other countries in which UPL doesn't exist, and the sky hasn't fallen. So the UK, you know, England and Wales is an example of that. Community paralegals have been active in South Africa for 70 years and were critical to um, the, the transition from apartheid to, to democracy. And so I think we, we what we need to be more focused on, um, what, uh, one of those things is these paths, pathways. Um, but I also think that we're at a moment where we need to be focused on implementing strong and sustainable programs. And I think part of that is a lot of learning that has to happen. Um, it's hard to study things that are criminalized and UPL has criminalized the practice of law for non-lawyers um, for a long time. And so I think we need to do more knowledge generation, um, more build more evidence about what's effective. Um, so just simply, you know, it, eliminating the barrier of UPL is an important piece, but it's only the starting point for um, what needs to be a more robust um, kind of engagement with how do you actually build and scale these programs over time. All right. Do folks in the audience have questions? Yeah, we've got a couple over here. That's okay. Yeah. Um, first one, I think this one's for Joy. Uh, what was the organization you mentioned that helped your staff become CJW so they could help folks make wills? I, the tribal consortium that we partner with is Association of Village Council Presidents, AVCP. Great. And other question I have here is, do CJWs play any role in criminal cases in Alaska, either in the tribal court space or the Alaska court system space? For the tribal court space, I'd say it's that's like a case by case question um, for the tribal court if they provide or allow um, represent, representatives um, in those cases. And that was probably a question for Alex who left. <laughs> but as far as the state court, uh, no. And I can say my understanding is that um, the VAWA pilot projects are not fully up and running such that there would be a role for um, those representatives, although law trained um, is a broader um, term than licensed state licensed attorney. Um, and so there may be opportunities for that, but we're not there yet within the state, to my knowledge. Anyone else? Why is the Washington uh, program sunsetting? Is it guild-based or is it performative-based? When you say guild based or performative based, what do you mean? Well, I mean, <laughs> is, it, is it like, uh, I mean, those are the two like, assumptions that I'm thinking it could be either is like other lawyers saying we don't like this and like coming together and, and you know, advocating for that. Or is it like they're, they didn't have like good empirical evidence and they're like, well, this hasn't really helped enough. The short answer is the Supreme Court changed um, and they changed and those new, the new people changed their mind. But the, the print, what, the experience that was underneath that change of mind was this is an incredibly barrier rich way of creating people who are not attorneys who can practice law. So you have something like 3000 hours of supervised practice. You have to have an associate's degree. You have to have a paralegal certification. You had to take a year of courses in a law school. No one could figure out how to get financial aid to work for that year of courses in a law school. Um, only one law school would do it, so you could run like 15 people <laughs> through this every year. And also when they rolled it out, they didn't think about, the regulatory costs were like $400,000 to create 28 people. So, which means their startups, startups are expensive, but that was a little bit inefficient. Um, and they also didn't think about part of what you have to do, particularly if we move to fee generating models, people have to understand how to have business models and business plans. And there was no training or thinking about that either. So the, so the pathway to, to being useful was kind of blocked by the design of the program. Set up to fail, yeah. Yeah, not on purpose. No, no, I, I don't mean it. <laughs> also three bar exams. And, oh, I forgot the three bar exams. Which is insurance, which isn't required of lawyers, but it's required. Well, I was just gonna say, you might as well go to law school and do everything once you, yeah, that's not. Got one last one over here. 
Um, can you discuss best practices for educating CJWs and how we prevent the creation of education and experience barriers that make those programs difficult to scale? Can you turn yeah. on? Um, so we talk about this a little bit in the article. I think the 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 way in which ALSC has begun to develop this program, I think, is innovative in a couple of ways. One, it's it's uh, asynchronous, so it's important, particularly because this model depends on people who typically already have jobs, right? They might be embedded in social service providers or volunteering, um, that they'd be able to take courses when they have time, um, which isn't. And, and also given just the, the rurality of the state, um, not have to travel in person to do that. They're also only about eight hours to 10 hours long. So they're not a huge barrier in terms of, um, of the actual training. And then the important thing happens, which is they get mentored by an attorney to take a case, actually do a case um, and, and um, build that experience as well. Um, I, I don't think that there is a lot of evidence at this point about how to develop these trainings. I say this as a researcher, and I'm cautious maybe <laughs> about what we call evidence. I do think it's one of the exciting things that Frontline Justice is doing is partnered with Ascendium um, to develop a national um, standards um, uh, uh, working group uh, on helping to figure some of these things out. Um, but my sense is that if we can train community dental practitioner, community dental aides to do extractions, we can probably train non-attorneys to do fairly complex legal work. We also know in the immigration context, um, there are what's called fully and partially accredited representatives. These are lay advocates. They've been around for 50 years. So there's a lot of learning we can um, build from that. There's a standard 40 hour training, but the fully accredited rep representatives are doing in court representation of immigrants, including deportation defense. That's about as complex as it gets for kind of standard litigation practice in the US. So there's no evidence that I've seen that suggests that we can't um, level up folks to do fairly complex work. I just think that there's a lot of learning that we have to do about best practices in building these trainings. Just to add one fun fact from our friends in the United Kingdom, um, they had a really expensive legal aid system called Judicare. So it's just like Medicare. You get, a, you get a voucher from the government to pay a private attorney to help you. At one point, like 65% of the population was eligible for this. It's demand driven. It's really expensive. So when, when neoliberalism came in, they thought, how can we make this cheaper? Um, we already have no restrictions on who can give legal advice. We already have justice worker models out here. Let's see if we can offload some of this stuff we're paying for to something that someone else will pay for. And they wanted to do it in an evidence-based way. So they commissioned an audit study that did blind peer review of the work of non-attorneys and then solicitors, office lawyers, across a range of civil areas, including immigration, but also employment, housing, all this kind of stuff. And they found two really interesting things. One is that everybody makes mistakes. So about 20% of the cases that the attorneys did got, got failing grades and 20% of the cases that the non-attorneys did got failing grades. But that also means 80% of the time, everybody's getting it right, which is good. The other really interesting finding though, was that if you looked at who got an A or whose work was, was rated excellent by the peer reviewers, the people who weren't attorneys were eight times more likely to get A's than the attorneys. <laughs> um, and it, it probably isn't their innate superiority. It probably is that they specialize in a few things or in one thing and they become really good at that thing. Whereas attorneys are trying, are omnicompetent um, <laughs> and trying to act that way. So I think there is, we need a much more evidence about how to scale. Um, we need some more thought about how to be sustainable, but we have pretty clear evidence that we can train people to do this work really well and they can be very effective. I think Joy mentioned that Terrence had a question or did it go away? <laughs> I can ask it if we got a minute. So I, I'm curious what kind of in the research or in the concerns going forward, what kind of unintended consequences you might be worried about? Or, and, you know, I was thinking about it in terms of, uh, um, the mass incarceration project we're a part of right now, the world's largest incarceration of human beings in all of history. And it's all post Gideon. And I don't think that that's, I don't think that's an accident. I think one of the unintended consequences of providing universal criminal representation was the ability to incarcerate more efficiently people en masse. Uh, and that's just one example of a, of a big unintended consequence. I'm curious if you all have any researching going forward or looking at this program going forward, if there's, any concerns about those kinds of 
big unintended consequence. <laughs> Too much justice. Um, I mean, it's hard to know. I'm a big fan of um, pre-mortems and trying to think about sort of future states. But, uh, you know, the one thing I would say I think is a big challenge going forward is really getting to this question of scale, right? Um, we know from the ALSC program, there's a lot of recruitment that's been very successful, but there's also a lot of attrition, right? People have busy lives, complex lives. Um, I think also for these programs, there are gonna be real challenges around getting um, the, the real engines of community-based uh, services behind it. So I'm talking about, I mean, legal aids in every state and every place are comparatively very small kinds of nonprofit organizations, but they're really large social service providers like Catholic Charities and others. We need those engines to be able to, to, to really scale, to, to, to scale this program. And I think that's a hard conversation. One, because of resources, right? Legal aid's not just going to want to hand over all of its grants to other organizations, but also because um, those organizations have never thought about providing legal services because they've been told that they can't, right? Or librarians or other kinds of actors. So I think there's, um, I don't know that there's a future state that I'm worried about, particularly in terms of unintended consequences, but I am worried about um, being really expansive about meeting this really, you know, as Nicole said, expansive problem, right? Most, the vast majority of low-income people, 92% legal needs aren't being met. 92% is a pretty hard statistic to, beat back in a meaningful way. And so I think we have to continue to be really imaginative about how we build out and scale these programs. All right, thank you all so much. This is a fantastic way to wrap up our day. And thank you all for coming. Um, I know I learned a lot, so hopefully you all did as well. Can we just get a last round of applause for all of our panelists? Um, we do have another group coming in to use this space, so um, you all are welcome to linger in the hallway and chat, but we're trying to be somewhat efficient in getting out of here. So thank you all again. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you.